What's that one?
for the afternoon session. So if you will find your seats, that would be delightful. And I have to say, uh, since a couple of my farm broadcaster friends are in the audience, I, Ron probably smacked my knuckles for not starting this episode on time. So, uh, Ron, you'll have to forgive me for running a little off schedule here. A broadcaster hates to be off time. So we'll make it up. We will hit our out cue even if we didn't start the session right at 1230 as promised. So. Once you finish taking a picture of the awesome artwork, our, is our, our graphic illustrator doing a tremendous job or what? And, and, and I have to say, I have seen as many tweets or Instagram photos of your work as I have anything else going on today. So uh, I guess that's the highest compliment in the digital era is that you've been retweeted and favorited as many times as I have probably. So. Lunch was a great meal, wasn't it? And a great opportunity to converse, to share some ideas, to get to know one another in this industry. You know, it's really a great place to work, isn't it? Agriculture in general and, and the meat, milk, uh, and egg industries in specific. It's an industry, it's a profession, and it's also a bit of a community. We all kind of know each other and we all have some shared values and interests and background and goals. So I love these events where we get to kind of know one another in, in the real world instead of just via the Facebooks and Twitters and emails of the world. I'm glad you had a chance to do that. A little reminder, if you haven't already downloaded the Summit app for your mobile device, do that because full panelist biographies, the biographies of all of our speakers, uh, as well as a number of other items of interest related to the summit agenda, all available in that application. So go to the Alliance website uh, or just search in your particular app store for the Stakeholder Summit app. Download that, and that will give you one more little piece of the puzzle if you're not already inundated between uh, tweets and live streaming. And I think there was a Google Plus thing that came across my screen from my friends at Truffle Media. So you, you've gotten this covered at all digital aspects through uh, these different pieces of the puzzle. Let's get right into our next panel as the panelists uh, come up and take their seat at the table. This session, and we're going to go out of order a little bit here because uh, one of our speakers for the panel is supposed to be right out of lunch. has had two flights canceled already this morning, but we want to make sure that he's here because I think you're going to want to hear from him. So we're rearranging the decks a little bit. This panel, the concept is does big equal bad? And I think that's a question a lot of us uh, Maybe we have our own opinions, but more importantly, we know a lot of people have opinions on how size matters in food and agriculture production. Our panelists are going to provide opening remarks, about five to ten minutes each. Um, they're each going to share with us a little bit of their background, who they are, where they come from, and how they look at this question of big equaling bad. And then we'll open it up for questions so that you can really get a crack at them and, and pick their brains a little bit. So let's meet our panelists. Starting on my left, Janice Person is with Monsanto. And I told someone yesterday at lunch she's at the intersection of cotton, agriculture, agribusiness, and travel media. I think she really is a neat character that I met several years ago through the social media stream. I think you're really going to get to, uh, to know Janice. And if you aren't already connected with her in two or three different ways in the social media universe, you might. Uh, on her left, your right, is a good friend of mine, Ray Prock, with Ray Lynn Dairy out of the beautiful state of California. He plays a dairyman on Twitter and uh, the various other social media aspects and is extremely involved in the dairy industry through leadership of several dairy industry organizations and working with retail channel partners. Uh, has a really great perspective, and no, he's not a millennial uh, like me long ago. We also have on the panel... Let's see, next on Ray's right, Cameron Nelson with the Illinois Farm Bureau. And on the far end, Emily Zwiber of Zwiber Farms, also an extremely active member of my social media streams. So uh, I didn't just handpick my buddies. These just happen to be four of the more active people out there in the universe and have a great range of perspectives, different production perspectives in the chain. So uh, why don't we start with you, Janice, with your opening statement for... Wow. 
they say you're ready for your opening statement, I feel like I should be addressing congressional and senators, you know. Um, but it is really nice to be here. This is my first Ag Summit. And um, when, when I saw the topic was about millennials, I like couldn't be more... Okay, sorry. I couldn't have been more excited about talking about millennials. So um, at Monsanto, we this conversation in the online space and sort of what's happening there and it affects us, it affects you guys and it affects the people on the farm like uh, a couple of these folks. And really when you look at that, we've been looking hard at millennials as one of the key audiences that we need to address. And so when you think about big and bad, um, you hear that a lot online. But I think in the conversation with millennials, what we're finding is, is millennials also love their iPhones. They also love Google, all those kind of things. You just need to have a real conversation with them. So um, I think in the, in the old mindset of mine, I may have heard some of the students that were up here earlier, and I would have thought they had preconceived notions about Monsanto in a really negative way. In today's world, knowing they're millennials, I walk right up to them and say, hey, I would love to talk to you. If you ever have any questions about Monsanto's and GMO's, I'd love to have some conversation with you and hand them my business card. Because those kids actually want to hear multiple sides of the story. They create forums on Facebook so that they can get not only personal anecdotes, but they can get real data. And they are very driven to understand the topics that they're passionate about. Um, I think one of the questions for us as a business is we always talk to people through things like Wall Street Journal and New York Times and things like that in the past and it's really changed now. So we have to talk to people where they are, which is driving us to do some things very differently like going to South by Southwest um, and things where quite frankly you wouldn't see any of these jackets but you might see a lot of ink in the room because like sleeves would be bared and tattoos would be displayed very proudly so um, you know it's a, a little bit of a game changer for a bunch of agriculturalists to be in that kind of crowd. Um, the third thing that I really wanted to bring up just briefly is you know about empowering agriculturalists who are millennials and, and letting them be true to their age as they tell their story and, and as they share it. And we're doing a lot of that at our office to try and empower our employees, but also to work with customers so that they know our story so they can share it. Um, what we found is a lot of farmers learned a lot about biotech in the early days of biotech. And now it's just so trusted that farmers don't ask very many questions. over the years but our farms have and we need to get that out and let people know that we truly are the same people we have the same work ethics uh, we care about our natural resources we care about our communities all those things are still the same we just have to package that differently 
and not package it with the red barn because ro agriculture has been romanticized so much that we end up having that as a threat and not an asset. Uh, so over the years, I've seen that change uh, there at DMI or Dairy Management at the National Checkoff. We've gone to started with a con content-based uh, marketing system to uh, market to millennials, Latinos, uh, and uh, your boomers. And this is where I'm going to put my plug in for the Gen Xers like Andy and myself. Many people have forgotten what Gen Xers are, but I think Gen, Ar Gen Xers actually are the bridge between the millennials and the boomers. Because as you heard someone else earlier speak about being 40 and not embracing this technology, there are people that are 40 that embrace the technology. So we kind of actually identify with both audiences. And I think we're kind of the, the best part of the Oreo cookie is always in the middle. And that's where we're at. So I it was, that's what everybody's going to do. There's your tweetable quote right there. <laughs> Uh, so, so Ray, while I, because I set the question up maybe uh, not as well as I should have, so tell us about, uh, in addition to your social media universe, your giant factory mega farm or, or wherever it is that <laughs> you you actually get your hands dirty back home the three days a month you're there. Oh, you you wanted to know about the when I actually pretend to be a dairyman. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. There in California at home where everyone's at, and I don't spend much time anymore. Uh, there's a great team that keeps it going. I'm in partnership with my parents and another brother. I have four brothers. Uh, we have 550 cows there in uh, Denaire, California. So if you draw a line between Yosemite and San Francisco, we're right on that line on the east side of the valley. On a clear day, which is a rarity in California, I get to see Half Dome and Yosemite from the dairy, which uh, kind of grounds you in the fact that uh, what, we, what it is that we get to do as farmers truly is a blessing that we get to work with God's creations every day. Uh, that I don't think anybody else can uh, say that they're that blessed to be able to do that kind of work every day in the environment that we do. Uh, been on back on the dairy uh, for about 17 years now, I think it is. Uh, married to my high school sweetheart, that's all in the bio. Uh, we've done some innovative things on the dairy. Uh, a few years ago, we went and bought a hay ranch in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Mainly, my father was looking for some recreation. Well, it's turned into more work. Uh, we actually grow our complete hay supply, which is rare for California. Being a smaller California dairy, we had competition for the hay. So we've been able to source that hay uh, by vertically integrating a little bit. Uh, we compost 100% of our manure solids. Uh, it's a sustainability front. Just all the things that you don't hear dairy farmers are doing. Uh, one of the things that strikes home with me is the various tours I've given on the dairy. I brought anti-Monsanto activists to the dairy that think that factory farms are exactly what mine is, and they walk away and say, well, that's not a factory farm. Uh, the resounding theme is uh, farmers have always been recycling or sustainable. Why haven't you been telling that story? And that's where it's made me realize we need to tell more of the story. So uh, outward facing, the dairy looks like a factory farm, but we really try and, even though we're small by California standards, we try and manage it as a commercial operation. And that's what I try and convey in my social media use is the values behind the system. So, so let's do a little show of hands just to kind of get some uh, real audience feedback. 550 cows? Yes. Is that what I heard? A 550 cow dairy. Is that big? I just think that's big. Where I'm anybody, at notice, anybody, in the anybody notice a generational <laughs> split there? I, I kind of saw that. That's interesting. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll have more kind of pop quiz uh, polls through the through the course. So, uh, Tamara, tell us a little bit about uh, about who you are and, and your opening statement of this concept of just big equal bad. Sure, I'm a senior director of commodities at the Illinois Farm Bureau. I will have been there 16 years this fall, and before that, I worked out here in Washington D.C. in um, agriculture and trade, public policy, and also biotechnology. And I know I'm small, so I was behind those things, sorry. Um, and I also worked in consumer market research. So it's kind of an interesting um, concept thinking about this big equal bad, because I think even though we're thinking about it in the concept of agriculture and how it affects what maybe people think of our farm size or the companies that we um, supply, I think in essence the whole question of does big, big equal bad, you know, is, has a foundation in other, many other organizations, whether it's, you know, the United Nations or we talked about AT&T this morning. And so I, I've always been interested in this concept. And the way I treat it is I, I talk about big, whether if I'm talking to 
Cargill about a contract that they might have with one of my farmers, or whether I'm talking to a consumer about one of my farmers who has a Cargill contract. You know, to me, big only equals big if you, I, big equals big as much as small equals bad. Big equals bad as much as small equals bad to me. Um, big only really e equals bad if you basically assume that everyone that works in that organization or that manages that organization or that's a shareholder of that organization or farm or farm family has kind of abdicated their responsibility to do what's right. And I think in today's age where you have, um, multiple forms of media, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Pinterest, um, you have Instagram, and you have pretty strong whistleblower laws. I think, and you have, you saw the young people we had up here this morning, um, you have folks that are willing to um, invest and get to know their food system or their farmer or the university, and they're wanting to take a very active role in um, solving issues that perhaps they perceive as problems. I think, too, I have not heard millennials use the big equals bad um, concept as much as I've heard the between millennials and the baby boomers. Um, and, and, and perhaps it's because I'm talking and hearing from uh, mothers sometimes, um, urban mothers in Chicago. We have a program in Illinois where the corn, soybean, pork, beef, and milk producers and Farm Bureau came together and all put money into a pot. And we've created a program called Illinois Farm Families. The website is watchusgrow.org. And they, um, these mothers were identified, they applied um, for the privilege, I guess, of being a farm, farm mom, a field mom, and they are active bloggers and active in social media and, and real life mothers uh, around the city of Chicago. And they um, were invited to join the program. We take them out to farms. We take them out to all sizes of farms. And then we get feedback from them. They ask questions. They can directly speak to a farmer. And one of the things we're noticing about these moms is that they're starting to get a little annoyed with some of the things they feel they've been fed um, by some food or branded marketing companies, or maybe it's not, I shouldn't blame the company, maybe it's just your marketing people, I don't know, but, um, you know, reference was made earlier to um, the young lady who went through her cafeteria this morning and said, it was said, we are pleased to offer cage-free eggs. I mean, I think when, when a company or a marketer decides I'm going to put this out in front of you as if it's better than your other choices. That that holds a real responsibility to it. If if it were me, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that was better unless I knew it was better. I wouldn't feel more comfortable. I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that was more sustainable unless I had the numbers and the metrics and the analysis to say it was sustainable. And I think that part of having an honest conversation with consumers. Um, or with companies or with company marketers is, is very important. It's something we, we really need to all work on together. Um, and in the meantime, what we end up seeing happening is lots of conversations on social media. And again, I think that was mentioned as an opportunity. It's been a great one uh, for the farm sector and for agribusiness. Um, I would note it also that in my mind, oftentimes big is a function of the regulatory process you live under. Um, companies get bigger, organizations get bigger, employers get bigger because they're trying to spread the cost of what it, it costs them to operate um, in an economy or in a city. And, and I would note that oftentimes I'll, I'll talk to activist groups or I'll talk to animal rights activists and they'll say, well, you know, we think farms should be this size or we think they should be small or we think this size farm is good, and but then they're proposing a regulation that is bound to double the size of every farm in that area. And I'll just give one quick example. We took 14 farmers to Europe last summer on an animal care tour. We visited seven different countries. We visited hog farms, chicken farms, cattle farms. We talked to farmers in England, France, uh, Holland, Germany and Denmark about the impact of the ban on sow stalls, the move to group housing in Europe, and to the letter, every farmer we went and visited, everyone we talked to in advance, and everyone we talked to afterwards said that they had doubled the size of their operation in order to cover the costs of the additional regulation. So, you know, it's, it's again, to, to know the full story, to really understand um, and, and ask questions and for us to be transparent and answer them. And with that, I will just say that information, those PowerPoints and everything from that trip are, the, are on the Illinois Farm Bureau website. 
Um, if you just Google EU market study tour, EU animal issues tour, I can provide the link later. Thank yeah. you. And I, that, that program with the mommies uh, that she referenced, learn a little bit more about that. That's a really interesting program and I think uh, has a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities already exploited and <laughs> in, in more into the future. So. Emily, uh, give us give us your take on you. You've heard uh, you, the the table set here pretty well. Give us your background and opening statement. Sure. Um, so uh, thank you again for Animal Egg Alliance for inviting me to be here. Um, I wear many hats, and um, today I think I'm up here because I represent the Egg Chat Foundation, um, which is a nonprofit organization that works um, to empower farmers to use uh, to connect in communities using social media. And what, did that all, what does that all mean? It means that we're trying to create uh, opportunities for farmers and ranchers online to engage in conversations about exactly what we're talking about today. Um, what's really important to them and how they can connect with consumers and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And in, in that role um, as executive director, I, I, I see a lot of these and, and participate, obviously, in a lot of these conversations, these vice of conversations between small versus big, GMO versus non-GMO, thing that I have to navigate on a daily basis. Um, in addition to that, though, I also, um, my husband and I, we uh, dairy farm with his parents in, in Minnesota, and um, we're, in all intents and purposes, um, Janice and I should probably be, you know, enemies. We're on the uh, opposite ends. Of I know we are. Actually, we're really good friends. I don't know why we didn't sit it's next like to each other. <laughs> but um, my husband and I are a fourth generation a dairy farm. We're organic. Um, we're small. We only have about 100 cows. Um, you know, I'm a millennial. I have three kids. You know, I'm what quote unquote, um, you know, is not. We're not going to say target audience anymore. But the the um, engaged consumer uh, that we're we're trying to, you know, that Janice is trying to connect with. And um, so it's very interesting that Janice and I have a really good relationship. And I, it comes back to, I think, what a lot of people have said this morning is relationships. And that's a key part of the millennial generation is finding those things that create a relationship and not just a superficial relationship of you're a mom, I'm a mom, we should all get along and that should be all good, but really creating a relationship. And, and part of that strategy that we use on our farm is social media. Um, I have a very active blog, Twitter, Facebook, um, dive into Google Plus when I have to. So, you know, it's, it's those type of things that um, my generation is really involved in and, and take an active role in. And obviously, that passion has led me into um, a career with Egg Chat as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's very interesting um, being on both sides of that fence and having to talk out of both sides of my mouth where there's some, I, what we believe on our farm and what I have to do as an industry too. So I look forward to this conversation today. So if you're a mom who blogs, does that make you a mommy blogger? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is a whole different, whole, different, whole different ball of wax. I, I, All right. I so. on the other hand, I'm not a mommy, but I go to a lot of mommy blogger conferences. So. She's a mommy, and she doesn't go to the mommy blogger conferences. Uh, well, I've been to a couple. <laughs> if you, as much as you travel uh, with Ray or, or spend time with him, maybe you, you can a mommy by you know having to shepherd Ray and keep. Okay, well, let's get into the Q and A. So there are a lot of buzzwords that uh, get tossed around. I think that's a good place to start. Lingo, terminology, and in, in particularly, we heard some of them already today, right? And some of the other panels, and we we tried to get some definitions. What is sustainable? Why local instead of some other particular buzzword? So for you panelists, uh, from factory farmer to industrial ag to big ag, or IT brave, a giant corporate factory mega farm. How do those buzzwords affect the overall perception of agriculture in this industry? What, what's your take? Janice, let's... I, I guess um, I, I'm definitely considered, quote, big ag. If you look at all those labels he threw out, big ag, and a lot of people put on Monsanto. I think what's really been interesting for me over the last few years as we started this whole social media opportunity and stuff is... Um, you know, people can put big ag as a logo or a building, but when you personalize it, when you start talking about what you do and you're part of agriculture, I think that's... So um, I've been able to participate in that conversation um, in a number of venues and even took a group of farmers and, and things into New York last year so we could have that conversation at the 92nd Street Y. And I think, you know, big... Big ag, 
and, and some of those other labels, what I was telling Sally at lunch today is I don't think millennials are that interested in the labels. They're interested in understanding. And so for you just to say, big ag isn't a label that fits me, it's just, it, it's just not helpful to the conversation. But for you to say, well, you know, I've had people call me big ag in the past, and I, I, I don't see it quite that way. I'd love to talk to you about that. Then people are really interested in engaging in this dialogue. And it's, it's the thing where you can't educate me, but you can help me learn. And, um, and that's kind of the conversation I have when it comes to almost all those titles. I mean, GMOs, for a long time, our industry refused to use the term GMOs. It doesn't matter. Everybody else is using it. So let's talk about what that is and what that matters, how that, how that touches each of our lives. And then you get to go where you can have an actual productive conversation instead of just throwing labels and buzzwords out. So I'm going to jump on the bandwagon with uh, Janice. And I think one of the big things we learned this morning is, uh, besides all the other things that go with millennials, and it really rings true for any segment, relationships matter and what currency do relationships trade in they trade in conversations and it's that putting a face back on the farmer putting a face on agriculture and that's one of the things that I've resoundingly heard or seen happen is any time you get to build a personal relationship with an adversary you pretty much take them and make them a frenemy more than anything and you, they start understanding that you have shared values, you have shared commonalities, whether it's hobbies or other things, and you can start connecting on things outside of what polarizes you. It's like relig talking about religion or politics at a family event. Don't touch them. So let's not touch what polarizes us. Let's come together and talk about the common themes that are around. And one of the most interesting things that I was able to do is it actually involves Janice taking a anti-GMO activist that was at an industry function and basically uh, to be uh, I was there. polite she ended up being irate because of the way that she was being talked to not talked with and that's what our industry has done a lot of we like to use, throw around the term educate educate is a bad bad term because nobody wants to be educated we'd rather have a conversation and through those conversations we can gain trust and influence we need to stop worrying about educating. So this, this person, they were trying to, I mean, basically she thought she was being educated. And uh, long story short, several blogs came out. I was able to accompany her to tour Monsanto. To this day, she's not anti-Monsanto. She's not anti-biotechnology anymore. She probably is not going to choose that for her lifestyle to eat, but she is an advocate for the industry because she understands where biotechnology is. We can actually take some adversaries and through personal relationships and conversations, move them towards the middle, and it doesn't matter if they're millennials, it doesn't matter if they're boomers, it doesn't matter if they're the, the cream in the middle of the Oreo cookie, like the Gen Xers, you can still connect with them on that personal level. And anytime you meet someone personally, it's a lot harder to not like that person or what they represent. Emily, I wanna, I wanna ask you as the millennial on, on the panel and, and as somebody who you describe yourself small farm organic. So why why am I still in this day and age such a controversy with all these other issues that we've talked about today? Um, and, and overall, why do you see this generation looking at um, farm size as an area where there's all this misperception, misconception? Um, farm size brings with it a story behind it, um, an emotional story. It's either grandpa or great grandpa that's been connected to some sort of image. And I know Ray was talking about taking that red barn out of that image, but I, I almost disagree with that in the, in a little bit that that red barn is what connects us. Um, you know, if there's that emotion, what does that really mean? You know, what does that red barn mean? It means a stable family. It means, you know, wholesome um, meals at, you know, together at dinner time. It's, you know, these things that our generation is trying to turn back to um, a little bit. You're, we're seeing a huge um, uprising in our, uh, in, our influx in um, homesteaders, you know, an interest in that, um, a lot of people going, um, Back to gardening, and that's just a really big thing with my generation, especially uh, um, young families that are doing that. And so that that imagery of that that red barn or small um, farm is something that they try to connect to. They're trying to get back to that really core family 
um, thing. Our, you know, my generation really believes in um, a lot of family values, core val family values. And so um, it's, it's fine, you know, when we're talking about this discussion of small versus big and how do you use that to your advantage, you know, not saying, oh, that's, you know, we have these bigger farms, we're more efficient, we can feed more people, you know, all the taglines that we've used for so many years now, it's trying to connect that emotion that the, the many millennials are already connecting with with that red barn and putting that into what we're already using on some of these, um, you know, farms that are uh, that are bigger, they're more efficient, they are feeding people, but that's not the message that millennials want to hear. So it's taking that emotion and putting that um, in someplace else so they can connect that emotion with um, another, another image of a farm. Uh, Tim, I understand you just got disease and I'm kind of interested uh, a lot of us in, and we've been pretty maybe in, uh, US North America centric in our conversations today but we know this is a pretty global industry that we're in these days so as you were across the pond of the UK um, actually on farms share a little bit about your experience and perceptions on the scale of agriculture there and what what maybe we can learn from uh, our cousins across the Atlantic Fairly interesting for everyone who's who's been over to Europe, or for those of you who haven't. You know, they've they've gone from you know very large production back in the 70s and 80s, and having wine lakes and cheese mountains and things, being highly productive to um, sort of having to justify everything they do, whether front. And we noticed there was a lot of transfer of land from one farmer to another when e almost every livestock farm we we visited um, outside of the one in England was was being managed by sort of a 35 to 55 year old guy who bought the operation from a farmer who retired like in the 70s so or, or early 80s and I don't know that they had the same kind of big land um, price drop like we had in the 80s but um, they they felt that they were very um, modern, you know, they're younger, that they could manage this operation, that this was a great way uh, for them to have a country style uh, life with their family. And you could tell their wives and children were very invested in the farm. But for us, it was like a big shocker that, you know, the farm wasn't in the family for 200 years. So you go to these places and there's very eager eager operators eager to do what they feel they can um, offer to society whether they have agritourism or whether they have um, visitors come but by and large the ones that like there's a Sainsbury concept farm so Sainsbury supermarkets has a concept farm for hogs where they have um, the sows in group housing and they have every all the sows on straw and, um, and it's super interesting. They bring a lot of school groups through. And one of the most poignant moments I had on that trip was, was we asked them, do you tell, because I'm a numbers person, and um, <laughs> do you tell the folks that come and visit your farm that you have a higher, um, I think it's pre-weaning mortality of the piglets if they're in that larger farrowing space with their mother? And they said, yeah, and I don't know what they they call it a dropout rate or something. They, they, they tell them we have more losses of piglets. And I said, does that matter to the consumer? And they said, no. No, they just think that the mother sow and the piglets look happier on straw in a bigger area. And and that really said to me that, you know, it. I think Jason Clay, he'll speak later, but he said something uh, earlier in a meeting this week about how in 1975, 81% of a, of a company's worth uh, was in hard assets and maybe 19% was in their image and brand and now it's the other way around 81% of a company's worth or value is in those soft things and I think that is where this whole conversation and and continuing to converse with people is very important I know for our farmers part in Illinois they um, if they're with their peers they're like embarrassed to say yeah I have a hundred acres you know but if they have 4,000 acres, they don't want to tell anyone either. They'll often refer to themselves as small. I'm a small farmer. I only have 1,000 acres. But I can also say that they struggle um, with this size comparison because for some of them, for, for one of the families I know that does have 10,000 acres, I mean, they have 13 family members working on that operation every day. And so if you divided it out per person, that's not a very big farm. So I think it's... Um, it's, it's hard really to get your arms around that small versus large question when it comes to farms today. 
So why why do we see this being an issue? So we talked about it from the millennial standpoint. For for the other three of you who haven't tackled this, why do consumers seem to automatically think that big equals bad? Janice, have you have you drawn any conclusions or hypotheses about why big is bad in the mindset of the the John Q public? I, you know, for me personal impression, but I think a lot of people see things in the food system they don't like, whether that's that they are eating more processed foods than they wanted, that come with a label, that they can buy it anywhere in the country, or any of a million other things, right? But one thing they can do personally to change that is they can start gardening, or they can be like my brother and have been four generations from the farm and still buy a farm and start making it his. So it all gets into what can you do, and you can't do everything on a big, huge scale, but you can do some things for yourself locally, and they're small. And so it ends up, they know what they're doing on a small basis is good for them, and it just kind of happens on the other side that that must mean big is bad for folks. I don't, I don't know how many people are out there proselytizing big is bad. There are a few. And we, you know, we could we could name some of those groups or something if we wanted to. But I think I think for some people, doing things on a local basis is really good. And I'm one of those people. I mean, I've grown my own tomatoes in my backyard. I have raised beds and all those kind of things. And those are really good tomatoes, right? Really good. So, um, and sometimes our food system as a whole doesn't deliver the same kind of great taste or something like that to us that we would like to have, and we forget to think of all those confounding topics like, well, that's because you're buying in one place and shipped, you know, you know, all those things. It's a really complicated thing, but when you come down, small things you can do, you feel better about. Big things that you can't identify with. Hmm, maybe not so great. I'm going to tie it back to the panel again this morning. I can't not uh, point out when it was made, the statement was made that the staffers see form letter after form letter after form letter, and it just becomes monotonous. Well, mm -hmm. I think what has happened is uh, people think that as we've gotten bigger on our farms and our farms look different, we've lost the personal touch. And that's what I was referring to with the Red Barn values without the Red Barn, is we need to show the emotion like Emily was saying, but we can't always show the Red Barn because the Red Barn isn't what every farm looks like. And it's that, again, it's that personal touch, the personal touch that comes from relationships. And that's where this new generation that we're marketing to really is based on emotion. They're based on having that personal touch, having it tailored to them and seeing that you can go out there. I know Janice has made the statement before that I'm passionate about my industry. She had talk, heard me talk about social media and my passion, but then she came out to the dairy and she's basically, I, to sum it up, I think her paraphrase, she said, I never realized how much passion you had for the dairy itself. It actually, you show more passion for the, the actual dairy farm than you do for social media or your actual industry. And that's something that we don't convey enough of, is how passionate we are about caring for animals. We don't show that a quiet dairy is a well-run dairy because the cows aren't mooing. Most people, they come to the dairy and they expect the cows to be mooing. That's because we don't show them what it is that we do every day on that personal level. We don't tailor it to them. And that's what we need to start doing in, in what we're using. Take the, the messages that we give our in media training to our other farmers. Don't just teach them messages, teach them how to make the messages personal so we can connect on that personal level and put that face back on the farmer. Okay. Can I add? Yeah, well, yeah, sure. um, I think, you know, relating it back to millennials, um, growing up, I, I was right kind of at that cusp where the 80s had, you know, I, I was born in 82, so the, you know, the 80s were happening and, and all that, and, you know, leave the farm, go get a better job, and then it kind of shifted to, no, you know, being on the farm is actually a well-respected, you know, um, career. And I think as egg in, in the egg industry and the different organizations we were in, we were constantly hounding, we're great business people, we're well-educated, we wear these suits, you know, all these things to really, um, you know, put us on a pedestal that we are a career that should be respected. 
And I think that's hurt us a little bit, um, especially with my generation. Right when I was graduating high school, that's when um, Enron thing happened. And if you guys know, remember that, um, a lot of that, um, you know, it just seemed like there was one thing after another that made us distrust the big, the corporate. Mm -hmm. And we were, us in agriculture, we're still trying to make put ourselves on that corporate pedestal to be respected. And I think it's kind of bit us in the butt a little bit. And so um, it's returning back to those shared values and those emotions too are going to um, really help us in the long run, I think. Yeah, good thoughts. So let's open this up. I'd love to get, get you involved. If you uh, haven't, I've had a couple of you already tweeting me some questions. Ladies are going to come around with a microphone, and let's uh, let, let's get to the audience participation part of the program. Who has the first question for this panel on this concept of big and bad? Uh, about two uh, two rows back. Hi, this is a little bit of extra information on the situation in uh, in Europe. Um, in Europe, the extra legal cost for a broiler farm, on average, just because of European legislation and the implementation is, is 5% for a layer farm that is 15% and it has been investigated uh, last year. Someone would be interested in a report, I can give it to them. Uh, there's a difference between Europe and the United States on the amount of agricultural land per person living in that uh, area. In, uh, in Europe it's 0.6 hectares, I'm sorry I don't know it by eight, four acres, and in the United States, it's 1.4. And if you add this up, it is indeed true what, what you say, um, uh, Tamara, that uh, farmers have to be bigger, otherwise they cannot make money. But there's two, two ways in which farmers do that. Some become larger, they stay more on the farm, they produce cheaper. But there's a small market for diversity, for, for having a chicken on Sunday or in the weekend, or for people who are a bit richer or who want to do something different. So there's up to 5% of the market for these, these specialty foods. What, apart from France, which is a different story, what I personally um, regret is that many people who are in the specialty market try to market their stuff on the cost of the farmers who work harder. And this is where, in particular, I think if you go in the Euro if in the US we go that way as well, then I think we should be very careful that nobody who has a specialty brand or a specialty type of production should do that on the cost of someone else because the welfare of the animals is as good as it was never before and the safety of food is as good as it was never before. And I think the people in the cities also have the right to know that. And it is also the responsibility of the people who make specialty food to, to preserve that message. Thank you. Perspective. So questions for our panelists. Questions for this group on this issue of farm size. I'm sure you have a few. I've got some coming in via Twitter. Yes, ma'am, right here in the center on this side. I think it's quite interesting in, um, I see it particularly in social media, but also in suburban areas, that you have a juxtaposition between what I call commercial family farmers and then your small maybe organic family farmers and you hear the organic family farmers say oh sometimes big is bad in talking about the commercial guys and then the commercial guys say well the organic guys aren't that good and, and they're not following biosecurity and they're not doing this so what do you all have to say about how to try to break down that fence or that barrier between those two different types of farming systems good question I deal with this every day. <laughs> You've never had this discussion, have never, you? Never, ever have this discussion. No, I think um, the, between all of us, um, organic farmers like myself, I mean, we're commercial. Um, Ray, he's not organic. He's small family farm. You know, so it's, we got to take the labels out of what we do internally first before we ever expect the, the consumer to, to drop those labels, I think is one step that we need to do. and. And two is, you know, um, I hate to say it so bluntly, but really worry about yourself and show your best foot forward, too. Um, you know, what I do on our farm, you know, we do it because it's, it's best for our family, our land, and our animals. And I always say that. And I think every, even though we're organic and whatever, 
I think Ray would say the reason that they do what they do is because it's best for their land, their family, and their animals. And so continuing to say that and continuing to make those connections. And you know what? I think I think it was you that talked about sometimes the marketing people do a really bad job, and that's really not the farmer speaking. So you know, be um, you know, have a voice in that too. And I know I have with our um, cooperative when there's been things that um, you know they're doing marketing which probably work really well to sell our milk, but just don't make me comfortable as a farmer who also has friends that are not farming the same way as me. So, you know, really encourage that conversation between staff that are maybe disconnected from the farm and the farmers that are really, you know, on the ground doing it, the work. I, and to just tag along on that, one of uh, the things that, and this is going to go into social media a bit, one of the things that social media has done for me as a farmer is it's connected me with a lot of other farmers, not just the customers off the farm. And one of those farmers is Tim, Emily's husband. And Tim, of I, Tim and I, I remember I sent pictures of we had modified our tank washer for a milk tank. I Tim had, Tim was curious of what we did, sent pictures to Tim, and we compared it. We compared different notes at different times uh, on different production practices that are similar. And that's the same thing. We have to, no matter what our production se segment is, Let's connect on the similarities and not worry about the differences as much. And I think that goes right over across the river into Capitol Hill. Let's worry about the things that we have similar and not spend as much time focusing on the differences because there's a lot of similarities. If any, no one has seen, Emily has her son here at this conference. Ironically, my son came to DC with me a few years ago to a conference and it was his first trip to DC, right here, same hotel. It's just one of those ironic similarities that we're more similar than we are. Mm -hmm. Emily's husband had her out picking up rocks in the field the other day. I was picking up <laughs> rocks in my corrals yesterday because we were regrading corrals. If we focus more on what we have in common and don't worry about what we don't, we're going to be better as society. We're going to be better as agriculture. And there, I can't see what we would be able to find wrong with that. I want to add to that, and it's part of what the lady from Europe was also saying. Um, you know, like, I think a lot of us, we get, get into better and best and all these kind of things. What I found more than anything works in today's conversation is to, to talk about what I know. And I know a lot about cotton, and I talk a lot about cotton. And I don't talk about those labels on cotton until somebody asks me a question. Because the vast majority of people are what you would call like the movable middle, and they don't know all the ins and outs of all these things that we think are so important to tell. So when you can talk about the basics of agriculture, the basics of dairy farming, the, it makes so much of a difference for the general people on the street. Think about what happens when you're at a restaurant and, and you order ice cream and you say, I'm a dairy farmer. They don't immediately say, do you put hormones in your, <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't go down that path normally. So if you can have that conversation online and you can have that conversation in your head, so when you're talking to people, you don't introduce all these controversial things so you can let them just kind of absorb good information, then you become their trusted resource and you become the person they want to ask about what what really matters to them. You know, so I answer a lot of questions about GMOs, but I'm not usually the one bringing the topic up all the time. I bring it up on occasion, but usually I, I'm just talking about agriculture in general and it makes a big difference for folks that don't understand ag. Um, back to that question, I mean, I think it's going to be very interesting um, to keep your eye on the organic industry because Paul and I have been um, trying to get our farmers who are not organic and our farmers who are organic to work together where we can and kind of stick to those areas where we have common issues. But if you watch the way the organic industry is, you'll see some voices now just talking about how something's being done for all the large organic companies or the large organic farmers versus the small and they're starting to try to hold up the small against the large and, and it's getting into the media and we have been working very hard in Illinois to try to keep our large and small organic farmers all on the same page because that will tear that segment apart even more than it already um, has. I'm just going to 
question here via Twitter as we're winding down the last uh, two minutes of our panel. Do you think quality of the product becomes reduced because of being concerned with quantity rather than quality? I don't think so, but I think the perception that some people can get. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. think about it. My mom makes chocolate chip cookies at home. I know how awesome they're going to be. The store and you buy chocolate chip cookies, are they the same? Probably not, right? I mean, it's just the basics. And for some people, they'll take that to mean that it's not as good. I, I, think, um, I think that's probably getting more rare, though, that people assume that. One time for one last question from the floor for this panel. Yeah, Bob Metz from South Dakota. Uh, my wife and I are both full-time farmers, and we have two sons and a son-in-law for the sixth generation on our farm. I, I was very happy to hear uh, that point being brought out that when we hear large farms, one of you brought out the point many times, there's multiple generations on that farm, which was not the case a generation ago, but when you buy a used combine, a used combine, for over a half a million dollars. Tractors constantly run a half a million dollars. We just can't have all these little individual farms, so that is why it's become very multi-generational. That's why it's, it sounds like a large farm, but if you divide it back up amongst my sons and my wife needs to have a full-time job, no different than most of your uh, spouses do, she chooses to be a farmer. I think she has that right, but that takes that many more acres for us to make a living than and I just think it's so important. And the other point is you hear corporate farm, but that's just a, a way of doing business. When you become multi-generational, now it makes all the sense in the world to go under corporate law because you need that farm to keep moving on. I just like your comments on that, and, and I just feel we need to get that point out. Uh, my last comment would be we put our farm into a public hunting program because South Dakota is very famous for pheasant hunting. We don't get we get a dollar an acre. I mean, basically nothing. We do it because we get people from this part of the country, from the East Coast, West Coast, coming to our farm and hunting. And and when I can say, you know what, that's my wife driving that other combine, and that's my sons driving those tractors and the trucks, and that's my cousin there. They say, hey, this is great. This is the way farming should be—a good family farm. I said, this is a corporate farm, and this is what you would call a large farm. It is still very, very much a family farm. Your comments. I think, I think that's a great story, and I think that's the story we need to keep sharing, and especially your last comment there about how people say and we should have more people like that, and I think we get that comment a lot, like, oh, you guys are doing a great job, you're not abusing your animals like others, but I think it's, it's my job and my husband's job to point out immediately that there aren't any others. You know, there aren't other people that are abusing their animals. I mean, there's some cases, yes, there's outliers, but the majority of the people out there are doing just the same job that we're doing every day and are invested in the same way. And we need to continue to, to tell those stories. And everybody's story is unique. And I know, you know, we use social a lot to tell that story. And I think it's the easiest way for us and it's the easiest way for us to connect. And with the millennial generation, that's, that's where they're at. If, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you. I took a bunch of um, millennial mom bloggers out to see planting the other day. We never said whether it was a corporate farm or a family farm or a big farm or a little farm, but they asked all those questions in different ways. And when they were given answers, they just thought it was Adam's farm. I mean, they didn't, they didn't target in, oh, so that's a big farm. They were just, they were so excited about being on a farm and having that experience that they were just taking in, oh, well, so how many people in the family are here? That's a lot. You get to work with your grandpa? You know, like people are excited about those kind of things. And they weren't, and then later they did ask, well, what kind of business is it? Because like you say, you're taking it over from your dad. What's that like? Because somebody had an accounting background, right? So then they, they asked, is it a corporate farm in a different way? And so it's, it's trying to understand the words they use instead of the words we automatically use is, is part of the issue for us in agriculture. We have more than others. What a great panel. I think we'll uh, agree. Some really good insight and perspective. How for Janice, Ray, Tamara, and Emily? And I know they're all going to be here for the duration, and if you're not already...
various other social networks, you sure ought to do that. Um, if you get a Snapchat request from Ray, I would advise against it, but otherwise, you should get on the... Uh, yeah, the only reason why I'm on Snapchat is because my 13-year-old son is on Snapchat. I'm not sure I want to get a Snapchat request from your 13-year-old son either, Ray. This is uh, you know, just quit digging the hole when somebody hands you the shovel, right? So what a great what a great day so far, and I think this next session is really going to uh, open your eyes even a little wider. We're going to tend to step from the concept of does big equal bad to how do we define or should we define or can we define environmental sustainability? Yeah, this is a this is going to be a good one. I've been waiting for this one for a while, so I want to bring up uh, our panelists. So. Roger, Jason, Aiden, Mitch, if you all want to start making your way this direction up front, as I will introduce you. Some reminders, if you haven't done so already, refer to the mobile app and you'll be able to get the panelists' full biographies, um, or you'll be able to find them on the Alliance website as well. This is, a, this is a pretty distinguished panel, and I mean that sincerely, not sarcastic. Chance to enter share the speaker's dais with uh, all of these gentlemen, and they all have some really interesting um, background and perspectives on this question of environmental sustainability. I'll start with just uh, brief um, introductions, and we'll have all of you actually give your opening comments. Uh, Roger Cady with Alanco, Dr. Jason Clay with the World Wildlife... Every time I do this, I'm afraid I'm going to say it wrong, Dr. Clay, but the World Wildlife Fund, right? And uh, or the WWF that I knew when I was a kid. You of can course, say Paul, WWF. Paul, we won the loss. That was okay. You won the loss. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yeah. It's, doc, it's, it's Dr. Clay's fault that I have to confuse WWF and WWE these days, right? Uh, Aiden Connolly, a great friend of mine uh, from Alltech, uh, is a he, he's a wine connoisseur, and I just know what kind of wines I like. And Aiden tells me if it's okay to drink them or not. Uh, and Mitch Abramson, uh, Mitch, you're. You're, you're the guy that gets the short end of the sticker because I don't have any clever stories to tell about you like I might have about the other three guys because I've been in uh, either speaking or social situations with them. So maybe we can try to come up with some clever story I can tell about you the next time Actually, we're on the... that makes me happy. I'm good with yeah, that. Yeah, okay, great. So, Roger, let's start with you. Um, give your, your background and your opening statement on this question of defining environmental sustainability. You just want my background or you want me to go on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can we have the slides, please, then? So my background, um, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, spent uh, half my childhood living on a dairy farm in the western state. I went to school at uh, Cornell, became a geneticist, went on as a faculty member for 18 years, joined industry 15 years ago, and today I'm the global sustainability lead for Lanco. Um, what I'd like to do in terms of defining sustainability, um, we can get into all kinds of discussions. Um, basically, sustainability has been defined as the ability for uh, today's generation to meet their needs uh, while preserving the opportunity for future generations uh, to meet their own. And it's supported by three pillars of social, economic, and environmental. What I'd like to do, though, is move away from that formal definition and state that sustainability is really about a continuous improvement. It's a process. It's a way of life. It's not a project. It's not check the box. It's not right or wrong. And um, one of the things we've been working on is, is looking at the environmental piece of sustainability. And uh, we've discovered that really to talk about sustainability, we have to expand the discussion about food. Um, and, and feeding the world. Uh, you've all heard about nine billion people, uh, and, and you could go to the next slide, please. Um, there's a couple quotes that come to mind for me. One is, if you don't learn the lessons of history, we, we're bound to repeat them. I'm not sure who said it, but if you look back at um, how societies have dealt with food shortages in the past, um, they've picked up and moved. Uh, if you look at great migrations and so on, most of those had to do with food and running out of resources, uh, and there were places to move to, or they turned into wars um, and taking over somebody else's property. So I think we need to, but I also think we need to learn um, about looking forward, which is we really don't have any more places on this earth to exploit. 
um, there are no more places to move to. Um, so if we can uh, move on, uh, we, if we look at what's driving um, this demand for food that we hear about, it's not just the 9 million people, it's the uh, growth in uh, the middle class. And I put this slide up, I'm not going to go through every bitty piece of it, but uh, those circles represent by continent where the middle class is growing the most. And I don't think it's any surprise that it's in Asia with China. In fact, I heard just two nights ago on CNN that this year to possibly surpass the United States as the largest economy in the world. And that's the U.S. has been the largest economy in the world since the 1780s. Uh, uh, 200, 200 years, 225 years, the United States has been the largest economy. So we're looking at change, we're looking at middle class driving, and what does that middle class drive towards? As you create more middle class people, the first thing they spend their disposable income on is, is meat and protein. Um, so we can talk all we want about Meatless Mondays. We can talk about the U.S. decreasing the amount of meat they're going to eat. We can have those discussions. We need to have those discussions. But overall, the world is going to increase the demand for meat and protein. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, this increase is 60% more, as estimated by FAO. And what we've done is say, okay, let's take this increase at face value. And we're currently looking at historical trends with regards to agriculture and how did we meet those needs, those growing needs in the past. I grew up in the sixth person's um, Silent Spring uh, was really a bellwether um, in, the, in the 1960s about um, these kinds of things we're talking about. Um, so it's not brand new. Uh, it's been around for a long time and we <laughs> We can, uh, we can say we've always been able to do it um, in the past. Why should it be any different now? Well, as I already mentioned, we don't really have much more land to exploit. Um, and how have we done it in the past, I think, is really important here. Um, we really haven't. And if we look at milk as an example, uh, milk production in the world has more than doubled since 1961. Um, but we took that number of how much milk's been produced and we divided it by the number of people. And what we found out is that there's actually 14% less milk available per person in the world today than there was in 1961. So we really haven't continued to meet demand. That's the first message. Second message is if we look at um, how this milk has been created, um, I won't spend a lot of time on the numbers on those graphs. I happen to be a numbers person myself. I know there's at least two others in here because they identified themselves. Um, but if you look at that, if you look at that black line, um, that's total milk production in the U.S. from 1961 to 2012, and you see that it's increasing. And and meanwhile, the cow numbers in the United States have been decreasing. And so that increase in total milk production is due to the fact that cows are producing more milk per cow. Um, you heard me ask the question earlier about this is the very North American centric conference we're at. If you look at the global situation, it's a very different situation. Milk production in the world has also increased. It's doubled, as I mentioned. But now that blue line uh, represents milk per cow, and the red line represents the number of cows. What you see is, is, is the world has really met milk production by adding more cows, not by increasing productivity. And every time we add an animal to the population, we add demand to the environment in order to keep those animals alive. So we've gone forward. Today, the global cow produces enough milk in a day uh, to provide about 32 glasses of milk. And we looked at the challenge of how do we freeze the environmental footprint of milk production, and is it even biologically possible? And what we found out is not only is it biologically possible, but it's extremely realistic. If we can just add a half a glass per year so that next year that cow produces 32 and a half glasses per day, and the following year 33, and the following year, and so on, uh, we can actually meet um, the growing demand for milk and uh, freeze the environmental footprint if we increase that production 
more than that half a glass per day, we can actually reduce the environmental footprint of milk production. And we're working on these stories in the other proteins as well. What does this amount to in terms of the environment? Um, if we stay on the trends where we're heading, uh, we can project about how much resources we're going to need. If we can start adding that productivity, um, we can actually reduce the amount of cows we need by 2050 by 66 million cows and what that in world population. What that saves is 747 million tons of feed. Uh, because we save that feed, there's 388 million acres of farmland that we don't need uh, for, cat, for milk production. Uh, that's an area about the size of Alaska, by the way. Um, and in terms of water, that's 618 billion gallons of water um, that that is reduced consumption by the cows. And we're only talking about the consumption there. We're not talking about uh, food, uh, excuse me, water for sanitation, water for processing, and water for irrigation. That's just the consumption. That's the equivalent of the water con domestic household water consumption for France, Germany, and England in a year. Um, that's what we can save um, if we start to focus more on productivity as opposed to just adding animals. This story replicates itself for the other proteins. We don't have time to get into it here. But what I would urge you to do is please go to sensibletable.com. Please join us um, in, in um, talking about this story and, and getting it out there. It's imperative. And I, my um, friend here and, and colleague, uh, Dr. Clay, I, I suspect I know what he's going to talk about. And it's imperative that we do these things um, and, and, and that the story is understood. And I implore you to also think about everything we do in terms of the globe and not just North America. Um, the rest of the globe, much of it is looking to North America as the source of where this protein is going to come from. So thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you, uh, one of my first speaking engagements out on the circuit when I started at Feedstuffs, I was on the panel uh, ahead of Dr. Katie, and he was giving uh, his presentation on sustainability. And I was really excited because Elanco had just released a white paper talking about how consumers buy food. And, and one of the big takeaways was that 90-some um, percent of consumers, and this, this plays into in just a moment, uh, bought food on taste, cost, and convenience. And I thought this was really great. And so I'm sharing this little tidbit as part of my presentation on how consumers think and why they hate us or don't. Well, Dr. Katie gets up as this distinguished gentleman from a major organization in my industry, and his first thing he says, I want to correct something the previous speaker said. <laughs> I about died sitting at my table in the audience, and it mattered because he's a numbers guy that I said 90 whatever percent it was, and he gave the actual percentage that the study said. So I died a little inside. So if I lose two or three years of my life, uh, it's your fault, Roger. So. Uh, I want to want to bring in our next panelist. So, Dr. Jason Clay with the World Wildlife Fund is probably my favorite environmentalist on the planet. Uh, about a year ago, he headlined um, a dinner uh, that hosted here with the National Association of Farm Broadcasting over at the Press Club and talked about some of these issues. So, Dr. Clay, take it away. So, those consumers that we've just been talking about, they go through that list of things, and in 2.8 seconds, they make their choice. That's how you pick a product off the shelf. Um, we have, I think today, a problem in the sense that we have 7 billion people on this planet who are all experts on food. And, and that's the problem. Because we don't share a common awareness. We don't have a consensus. We cer certainly don't have a strategic focus about how to move forward, much less a strategy. And I think without a common awareness, we're never going to have a common strategy. So part of the role of, of a group like WBF is to help build that awareness and to help build consensus about what is important. And that's, that's what our strategy around, around food is. Um, are we supposed to talk about ourselves? Yeah, by all means. I actually did grow up on what anybody would call a small farm. Uh, and lived on less than a dollar a day in the U.S. for about 15 years. Um, my father was killed in an accident on that farm, uh, and then things got tough. Um, so for me, there's a real identification with small farmers around the world and also a real need to give people options. 
farming is one of them, but not farming is also one of them. I've done work in human rights, I've taught in universities, etc. Um, but I think everything always came back to farming, whether it was in refugee camps in Africa, whether it was in famine uh, camps or whatever. And, and at World Wildlife Fund is kind of the same thing. What we've come to realize is that if we don't get where and how we produce food right, we can turn out the light and go home. Because agricultural sprawl will take care of all biodiversity on the planet. If we need to double food production by 2050, or double net food availability by 2050, and we do it only through production, then we're going to double the amount of land we use today. We're going to double the amount of water we use today. We can't do that. We simply cannot. There's not enough there. So we've got to really focus on other strategies. We've got to focus on productivity, on efficiency, on waste, on consumption. And we need to have a goal of doubling net food availability. And that lets us work on both sides, the production side and the consumption side. A group like mine doesn't buy or sell food. We don't make laws or regulations. So we have to figure out how to change the conversation around food, how to make people aware of both what some of the potential outcomes of business as usual are, as well as what some of the opportunities of doing business differently would be. And that's why we decided to do a work, or a bit of research about what are the biggest threats to the places we care about. And turns out it was the production of food. 90% of the time, it was food production that was the biggest threat. And it's not things like some of the most traditional crops, like wheat or rice, but it's the crops that are the most, that are changing the most in terms of response to demand. So it's corn and soybeans because they're feed or because they're biofuels. It's beef because people are consuming more animal protein. It's dairy because people are consuming more dairy. These are the ones we have to get right. The amount of land in wheat, the amount of land in rice is going down. That's not what's expanding around the planet. Palm oil, soy, uh, sugarcane, cotton, beef, dairy, those are the ones, and aquaculture. I, I don't think anybody's mentioned aquaculture. It is animal livestock as far as I'm concerned, and we have a, a big program on that. We focused on, on the primary production impacts because we see those as having the biggest footprint on the land and the one that is being least addressed by others. We haven't focused on what uh, are more intensive indoor operations, whether it's poultry or pork or any of those things, because from our point of view, if you get feed right and if you get the waste stream coming out of them right, you've dealt with those environmental issues much as you would with the factory. But uh, avoiding that image just for a minute, it's really about the impacts and how you reduce them. I think we've also really wanted to create a, a, a science-based discussion about this issue, rather than having seven billion people spout their opinions at each other uh, and, and be able to choose peer-reviewed data to back up anything that they already believe. We're interested in looking at how we we, we, we basically we focus on what was just talked about. We move from extensifying things like milk production or beef production in the Amazon to intensifying it, but doing it more sustainably. How do we get more from less? How do we produce more calories and more grams of protein with less land, less water, less grams of protein going in as feed? Those are the questions of the 21st century. If we don't get those right, uh, we're going to be in some deep, deep trouble. So if we talk about what we think is the key impacts of, of agricultural production, it would be habitat and biodiversity loss. And that's not just forest, that's sod busting, that's grasslands in other parts of the world, it's wetlands. It would be feed, and that's the grains that we we're talking about, but also things like fish meal and fish oil, which come from the oceans and are used is, as feed ingredients. It's about water. Water in, water out. So how much water is taken and how, what is the form and the quality of the water that's put back into the environment? And then it's other inputs like medicines, chemicals, etc. But the goal here 
I think, has got to be to move away from focusing on a single thing. Farmers love to tell you about how much they produced, how many tons of this or how many bushels of that. The issue is really how do we optimize a lot of different things, some of which may be contradictory, versus how do we maximize one thing. Because moving forward, sustainability is going to be about optimizing. And intensification is going to be about optimizing. It's going to be about a thousand cuts. It's going to be about a thousand little things that make you more sustainable, not one big thing. And we have to get our heads around how to think about that. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to work with large, diverse groups of stakeholders to figure out what do we want? What would good beef, good dairy, good soy, good corn, good sugar, good cotton, what, what would that look like? What are the key impacts that we would like to see measurably reduced? And then begin to develop programs to help farmers actually achieve that. Um, those are science-based also, but they're targeted. They're on six or eight things, not a hundred things, not a thousand things, but also not just one thing. You can't focus on just one thing and, and think that you're doing sustainability. We've also, I think, really shifted from a practice-based approach. If you talk to a farmer, most of them will say, okay, well, what can I do to get better? Tell me what practices would actually allow me to, to, to meet whatever it is you're saying I should do. And the answer is, it's not about the practice. It's about the performance. There are probably 15 different practices that would allow you to get better. And depending on your size, your scale, how much money, how much labor, how much land you have, you could use a different set of practices. So don't focus on the practice, focus on the result. And then it works out better for the different farmers, not just in the U.S., but, but around the world. Yeah. One of the things that... Do I have any more time? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the hook. <laughs> right. Okay, one, one more thing, and I just want to plan it, because I assume we'll talk about other things going forward. But yep. What we're seeing now is that a lot of different producers are beginning to share information about how what their impacts are. What are the ways to reduce them? What are the costs? What's the return on investment? And the reason they're doing that is because sustainability is a pre-competitive issue now. Everybody depends on getting better. And it's not something that is going to differentiate you in the market. Put another way, a market is going to be defined by the worst performers in that market, not by the best. And so if there's a reputational issue, it's going to be because of what some bad performers are doing. So we have kind of looked at that issue as an organization and said, you know, actually, if you wanted to double productivity globally, and if you wanted to cut the impacts by half, you wouldn't focus on working with the better farmers. You'd actually focus on working with the worst farmers and help them get legal adopt more efficient practices, begin to be more productive. The bottom 25% of producers of any commodity anywhere in the world produce 50% of the impacts and 10% of the product. So that's where the real gains are to be made. All the certification programs in the world focus on the other end. They do it because they care about the bottom, but they're not actually moving the bottom. They're just moving the top. So how do we move the bottom? That's, I think, a real challenge going forward. I would, I would highly encourage you, if you're not already writing down questions as these uh, gentlemen are talking, to do that. Because I know the first time I heard Dr. Clay deliver his presentation uh, really opened up my way of thinking on this question of sustainability. So I'd really encourage you, because I want to make sure we have lots of time to get to your question at the end. So. Uh, next next uh, player in the game, uh, Aiden Connolly of Alltech, uh, another global company and, uh, and, and a global traveler who's seen all of these different questions in play in a lot of different countries of the world. So, Aiden, uh, give us your, your brief um, background and perspective on this issue. Yeah, so uh, Aiden Connolly, uh, I've been living in D.C. for six years, but as you can tell from the accent, I was born a little bit further east. Uh, not Delaware, by the way. And um, I've, uh, with Alltech, I've uh, been lucky enough to travel to over 100 countries, most recently uh, China, though I've lived in Brazil four years, lived in France, uh, lived in many different countries. Um, this whole area is something that's really dear to my heart as I sit in uh, C3A, being traveling, being pulled by Delta around the world. And I think it's very, very clear from Alltech's perspective 
uh, it's a problem, it's a, it's a challenge that agriculture needs to solve. Um, obviously, one of the key parameters of what we're facing is that more people are eating more meat, they're eating more milk, and uh, are drinking more milk and eating more eggs. And perhaps that's a great thing for us. Um, sometimes when I go back to Europe, I read these stories about how we should convince people to become vegan or vegetarian, but it never happens. When people get a taste for animal proteins, they tend to consume those animal proteins and continue uh, consuming those animal proteins. And that's occurring on a worldwide scale. I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about uh, the 20 trips or so that I've done to China in the last 18, uh, last 18 months. Um, but it's a fascinating country, but it's a country such a, like India, like many parts of Africa, that's consuming more and more when it comes to food. Obviously, more people on the planet means more requirement for more food. Require, at the moment, as both of the previous uh, commentators mentioned, seems to require us to have more land. And yet, we're not creating more land. We're not creating more rain. We're not creating more water. And we're not creating more sunshine. So somehow or other, we have to get more with the same, or perhaps even more with less. And it's fascinating to me to see, particularly when you go to China, how they see the ownership of land or the control of land almost like a form of uh, geological leverage. That they're playing a lot of politics, particularly in, in Africa, to try to control uh, food production now and in the future. And some uh, commentators describe food as the new oil. I think it is appropriate. Uh, when I went into agriculture, I think my parents never understood why I didn't go into something uh, was a little bit more honorable, like banking or real estate. Uh, nowadays, I think they changed their mind on both of those. They'd agree that food is uh, much more honorable, uh, agriculture is much more honorable, much more exciting in terms of the future than, uh, than either of those other two career choices. Um, Alltech came out in 1989 with a statement that said, we want to be animal, consumer, environmentally friendly. So that's uh, 24 years ago. Um, about a third of the audience stood up and left. They were shocked. They said, why should agriculture care about the environment? What should they care about the consumer? Why should we care about the animal? Now, it's difficult for us to comprehend how far we've come in 25 years, but we have actually made that progress. And the reason was because we were totally focused on producing food for the lowest possible price. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, our thinking has changed, and I think probably our thinking will continue to evolve in the next 25 years. Um, the next speaker, uh, Mitch uh, Abrahamson, probably will refer to uh, whether we can continue to improve feed conversions, but we've made massive progress, and yet if you look at chickens, if you look at hogs, if you look at what we're doing in, in aquaculture, we could see feed conversions reach one-to-one. -one. Some commentators believe we could be lower than one-to-one, -one because of course food typically contains a lot of moisture, and what we feed typically contains very little moisture. So. Theoretically, the feed conversion of a chicken could be 0.4 in the future. And um, what does that really mean? I think it means we're not getting out of our genetics, whether it be plants, whether it be cows, whether it be chickens, whether it be aquaculture, we're still not achieving the genetic capacity of that animal. So my view of the future in terms of sustainability. When we talk about sustainability, inevitably, we seem to refer to what we need to do from a technological point of view. And maybe, you know, from a Lanco perspective, that will be we need to use more antibiotics. Maybe from an Alltech perspective, we need to use more enzymes. Uh, maybe others will look at genetics and say we need to do something better, such as Cobb might refer to genetics. But it seems to me that increasingly the future will be about data management. And in the same way as we've embraced data, data management in supermarkets so that we understand exactly the consumer behavior, and we're at the moment embracing that same data management on farms when it comes to growing crops, cereals, be it in Eastern Europe, be it in Brazil, be it in the Midwest. I see that when it comes to meat, milk, and eggs, data is going to be the form by which companies distinguish themselves and become much more efficient. And measuring that data, whether it be knowing exactly not just how much milk can a cow produce, how she produces milk depending on different diets, but also where that milk varies, whether it comes from one quarter of, a, of the other compared to another, being able to segment or send that milk for cheese, or if it's got high somatic cell counts, try to treat it. That's the sort of information that we're going to have through these robotic uh, milkers. The same thing on chicken farms, whether we're measuring the body temperature, 
of a chicken, whether we're looking at the response of fever response, whether we're actually measuring in real time the, uh, the weight of those chickens on the farm as they walk around, or from our perspective, Altec's perspective, using nutrigenomics, in other words, measuring how nutrition impacts on gene expression. Now these are all big, big ideas and big technologies, but they're, for me, they're less than 10 years away in terms of animal agriculture production. And that is my view, and that's Altec's view of where sustainability is going. We need to be embracing these technologies in a way we haven't done so far. And if we do that, those technologies move well beyond GM, move well beyond the debate on antibiotics. They move into debates that perhaps we haven't had, but we're going to have to have if we're going to compete and continue to compete in the world sca uh, stage. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. And uh, our, our fourth panelist on this uh, topic, and, and uh, I think, wow, we're we're really hitting on all cylinders uh, so far, so we'll hand it off to the anchor man on this re relay. Dr. Uh, Mitch Abramson is uh, Director of Vice President of Research and Development at Cobb Van Tress. So, Mitch, Great, thanks. floor is yours. Um, yeah, just a little bit of my background uh, and, and kind of prelude to, to why I'm in the job I'm in today. Um, I started off as a PhD student working on cancer and moved from that into zoonotic infections, moving out of animals into humans, uh, part of the, I'll say the early 90s and the, and the AIDS population be a big focus and started realizing kind of the last point Aiden made about applying technology to solve problems and agriculture I think has got some problems that technology can help solve and, and the perspective that we have really involves the one question we're all sitting here is how are we going to feed the world? And our perspective as a genetics company is a little bit different in that we know there are management solutions out there. We know there are going to be impacts regarding how regulatory comes into play, regarding how, how farmers and, and how the consumers are expecting food to be uh, produced and, and some of the rallies of that. But from our perspective, we find it feel like we're in the crosshairs a lot because people expect that we are going to really figure out how to have an animal that's going to help solve this problem. On um, Whether it's a chicken uh, for meat or laying eggs or cattle, and we talked about a half a glass of milk and the impact of that, uh, there are some expectations out there. And, and from, a, from a breeding company, a genetics company, particularly in chickens, you know, there were 30 or 40 of these breeding companies around in the, in the early 60s. Uh, today there's probably three or four players in the game, and with Cobb and Aviagen, we probably represent 90 to 95 percent of the genetics that go around the world. Uh, we market our bird in 80, 90 different countries. And, and so we're exposed to lots of different, I'll say, demands as to what that bird is, is being expected to do. The responsibility we have is that if we don't have the right bird, Aviagen doesn't have the right bird, we're going to have some problems. And so we really take it to heart that there's a lot of responsibility sitting on our shoulders uh, to make sure that we have the genetic stocks that will meet those needs. Our time frame is five to ten years out there uh, for us to put a different kind of bird in the marketplace, I need a good target that I start working on today and I probably need three or four efforts against that in maybe ten years and we all better hope that we do a good job at trying to get there. Um, I was asked a little bit earlier today why I'm here listening to communication with millennials when my direct outlet for my product is two or three steps away from the consumer and the millennials and the answer that I have is that it really is going to be defined by the millennial generation 10 years down the road as to how am I going to be able to help facilitate food security. Um, the economics, how to grow chicken, how companies make money with chickens, we know that pretty well. We can drive fee conversion improvements, we know how to drive weight improvements, but some of the things we don't know about are things around how are we going to define environmentally friendly, are we going to start as one of the panelists said this morning, take an account of all the costs involved in producing the animal, will we tax that, will that be part of something that my customer has to deal with, you know, what is going to be economically viable, and, and the real wild card for us is what's going to be socially acceptable. These are things that as a genetics company we need to get a good handle on today so we can start working to, to get an animal that will be able to do that. So breeder and broiler traits, Boy, if that was the only problem I had, we'd keep moving forward just like we are. Can we hit a 1.0 fee conversion? Probably. Can we get birds to look different than they do today? Absolutely. We run genetics programs, Avigen runs genetics programs that are so large that we had the ability with selection pressure to design 
a bird that will actually meet these requirements if our, if our customer helped define it. But the rules of engagement are changing on us. What are those political issues that are coming, how we grow a bird in Europe versus how we're growing a bird in the United States today? What's going to happen to my customers? Um, food safety is going to be talked about differently. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around salmonella out there, and, and is salmonella is regulated differently maybe going forward in the future? What's that going to mean to my customer? And more importantly, that customer is going to push back on me and ask, hey, I need a bird that does something different um, to do that. And then antibiotics coming out of the food chain, different kind of feed additives that may or may not be available, new things that will come on the market. Um, how are we going to manage the health of those animals with a different set of tools 5 and 10, 15 years down the road? And then are there going to be costs associated with heat production coming off of a flock? What's electricity going to cost to cool birds? Are we going to be tackling the water going in, the tackling the water going out? Is there a huge issue on, on water uh, conversion that we don't have today that's going to be really important? Those are things that we need to get into R&D programs sooner than later. And then social acceptance. And social acceptance is one where when you listen to the, the conversation this morning, boy, people have a view of what a chicken should look like, what a cow should look like. Is it the red barn? Is it a factory farm? And those are things that will be putting some pressure on the Chipotles and the McDonald's and the KFCs from their interaction with consumers about what they can talk about with their product. So we've got all these things pushing in on this poor bird. And we probably have the ability to go just about any direction we want to, but we can't go in all directions at the same time. And we really have to make some decisions today about what do we think are going to be those drivers that, that are really going to be the ones that are going to make a difference in our, in our targeting of, of feeding the world. And so we look at this a lot. And this is uh, uh, just a, a little bit to, to talk about. You know, We measure about 60 or 70 different traits based on everything you could ever imagine that you would measure in a chicken. And we've got them sitting in a computer, manage that data set. We can pick birds, but we've got to find out the balance. What is the balance between some of the economic drivers today, the economic drivers we'll see in the future? You know, if corn hits 12, 13 bucks a bushel, we're probably not going to feed that to chickens. What are we going to feed chickens? What do they have to eat? What kind of digested program do they need? What kind of feed additives are we going to be able to put in to help this bird get the energy it needs? What are going to be some of those welfare issues that are going to affect how we grow our birds? What are people going to accept as, as, a, as a perception of, of how the food chain should look? And so those are the things from our perspective that if we're going to meet our responsibility and really help drive sustainability within the food projection chain, we need to really be thinking about this today. And, and that's why we're here at the table participating. It's a great perspective, and obviously we've kind of covered the waterfront here with uh, speakers in four very different aspects of the discussion on sustainability, and uh, you've gotten the, of the expertise and the thought and the depth of knowledge that they bring to this topic. So let's let's open it up. Um, I had a couple questions from Twitter to get us uh, ladies with the microphones around as well. The, the first question I thought was a really good one. Um, and it, it goes something like this. So which has better odds? Uh, a universal definition of environmental sustainability being adopted or uh, Ohio State linebacker Ryan Shazier being drafted by the Packers tonight? <laughs> okay, that was actually a question from Twitter. I didn't make that up. If you follow it, so it was all in good fun, and I won't tell you which uh, member of the audience submitted that question, uh, but, but I thought that was a good one. So a real question. And Dr. Clay, we'll start with you. One of the um, one of the followers on Twitter asked, "Would the organization that you represent be comfortable producing more milk per cow using technologies, say, for example, uh, the technologies that Alanco produces to help uh, on its milk expression? What's your view on the efficiency? You'd be talking about." GMOs on seed crops and, and insert your technology here. Talk to us about that as part of your vision and portfolio. So I think technology is definitely, I wrote a paper looking at what are the, the different strategies that we're going to pursue to double, in a, in, a, in a cumulative way, double food production by 2050. And technology, we can't take it off the table. We can't take genetics off the table either how it's going to be defined and what's going to be acceptable to different consumer groups and different countries even is different because there are seven billion experts and so they're going to have opinions about this kind of stuff. But I think what we've done 
and I'm not trying to avoid your question, but I think this is a complicated <laughs> this is a complicated issue, and part of what we have not done well to date is create a platform to talk about it. And we haven't built consensus around why we need technology. It's just about whether the technology is good or bad. And, and that's not a good way to have a discussion. And, and, and even the understanding of what the technology is. I mean, take GMO, for example. 50-55% uh, of all the GMOs that have been registered are for human health. All the insulin on the planet is GMO. Nobody argues about whether that's good or not. 30-35% uh, of all the GMOs on the planet are food additives, enzymes, bacteria, etc. for fermentation, other things. Nobody argues about that either. Even the Europeans don't argue about that because they use them in French red wine. They use them all the substitute for rennet and cheese is now a GMO. I mean, so all these things are used in a lot of stuff. It's the 5% or less that are actually food crops that we talk about a lot. Now that just suggests to me that we don't actually know much about this topic. And so I think you could then begin to sweep into this whole thing growth promoting, promoting uh, inputs. You could put into this same discussion animal welfare. You could put a lot of different things in there because we haven't created a discussion about this that leads to, of course, differences of opinion but at the same time, a more uh, willingness to agree to disagree. I mean, it's kind of like in the previous panel where somebody took people to a conventional farm and talked about GMOs, and suddenly they weren't pro-GMO, but they weren't anti them quite to the extent they had been. Well, that's the kind of discussion we need, because these are tough issues that we're facing at, at the level of a planet. We have, to, we have to really dig into them. So technology can't be off the table. Different people are going to think different things about it, but let's have a science-based discussion about it, and let's look at what the pros and cons are. So there's a good follow-up. We heard from this morning from uh, two different groups of You just used the S word, Dr. Clay, science. Like maybe we're starting to get the impression that the millennials, science isn't wish it was. So, and, and I'm, this isn't necessarily uh, you. You have to tackle it by yourself, but. How do we as men of science, as an industry of science, and numbers, and all of these other things that all of us in the room feel comfortable with, get past to this generation that feels more than thinks? Roger, go ahead. Um, so I took the time to speak with one of those panels of millennials, and, and actually one of the things I'd like to focus on is the millennials aren't really as different as we think they are. One of the things they have available to them is this thing that, and so there's all kinds of information available. And what I also heard them say is that they want information, they want sound information. So I, I don't think it's that they're against science. It's just they're in such information overload with respect to what they can have available through Google and, and all kinds of searches that it just becomes totally overwhelming. So I think that's the bigger issue rather than they don't, that they don't um, respect science. The, the second thing is kind of a follow-up to what Jason was saying is there are forums being created. One of the things we've become, and millennials are, are, are we're impatient. And I would say we're impatient as well. We look for small answers. We want right, wrong, and as was said, on this table, uh, sustainability is going to be about optimizing, and optimizing isn't something that we in society are very comfortable with because we don't understand it. And I happen to be part of, a, of an organization today, or Alanco is part of, and I represent Alanco, called the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And, and it's, it's only a year or so old, and what have we accomplished is um, this week, we're finally going to close comments, public comments, on what the principles and criteria are to, dis to define sustainable beef. And we took the processes that were discussed in the previous panel about finding where a very disparate group of organization ranging from um, corporate entities like McDonald's and Walmart and, and uh, Alanco and NGOs and farmers and producers of beef could get together all with extremely disparate views. And we found one thing that we could 
agree on, and that was that beef would continue to be here in the future, and it needed to be produced in a sustainable way. And that's the only thing we could agree on at the beginning. And what this forum is becoming and defining itself as, is that place where we can have the hard conversations in a safe place. And, and so I think more, it, the other part is it's going to take patience. It's not going to be decided in the next three months. It's, it, and it's also going to be evolving because situations change. So um, those are some of the things I think we have to take into account with regards to sustainability. Um, as a father who has two millennials, I think I've got some sense of uh, some of the challenges of communicating with them um, in all aspects. Firstly, I think that uh, the way I think that we need to engage them is to obviously be as optimistic about the future of what we're doing, about the capacity of what we can achieve. And what engages the most is the idea that we're going to feed people, be it uh, 3 billion people who want to move to cities, be it uh, moving from uh, 7 billion to 9 billion. Some people say it might be more than 9 billion if we continue to grow. And I think that that is a way to engage them in something they see as a bigger picture. And that bigger picture then is a, the framework or the lens under which I certainly would introduce the concept of using new technology. That said, I've, got, I've had some very difficult conversations with them. I find it very difficult to have a conversation about why a laying hen should be in a cage. I have a very difficult uh, to explain why a sow should be in a crate. Uh, why, when we've got uh, porcine uh, epidemic uh, PD virus, um, why it is that we're feeding back uh, some of the intestines to try to give them immunity to that disease. So once you engage them, you also have to be prepared for the fact that some of the things you do in agriculture are more difficult to explain to somebody who's grown up in a city or has not been on a farm. Now, the ideal would be for us to bring them to the farm and let them see what we're doing, and hopefully what we're doing can actually stand up to the scrutiny of being under the, uh, under the light. I've worked on farms, as we all have. I've been on farms where farmers did things that I wasn't proud of. I didn't think they should do it either mistreating animals or otherwise, but they were the farmer, it was their animals, and I didn't say anything. Uh, maybe that's not going to be part of our future. Maybe part of our future is going to be when we see things that we know are done by bad actors in our business who aren't efficient, who aren't doing the right things for their animals, or more to the point, aren't doing the right things perhaps even for their own economics, because a mistreated animal is an animal that's not going to produce that well. I think we have to have systems also for removing those bad actors from our, from our industry so we do have a great story to tell, and so we can proudly stand in front of those millennials and say, our job is to produce enough food to feed a billion, two billion extra people on this planet and do so in the right way. Outstanding thoughts. Did you... Just at a, at a kind of 30,000 foot level, I think we have a, a bigger problem here than we're acknowledging, and it's not just around science. With big data, you have the ability to choose information that reinforces what you already believe. And we don't have the discipline to actually look at, I mean, science is a, is a stepwise approach. For 60% for of the research that shows this, 40% shows something different. And, and it's going to be moving in a certain direction. It's always going to be possible to find a peer-reviewed journal article to say anything you want to say about anything. And, and, and that's a problem. Uh, so. I think we are at, just as we didn't know how to use this 25 years ago, I don't think we know how to use big data today. And I think we need to get better, not just at understanding what is, but how do we develop methodologies to anticipate and predict what's going to be using big data, which is the promise of big data. But we, we don't know how to mine data at all right now for that. We know how to mine it for what we already know or believe or, or want to prove. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a funny kind of thing going on here. Uh, hopefully, people who are a lot more adept at running the numbers right. and the data will uh, give some answers on this. Op-ed in the Wall Street Journal this week or last uh, about uh, the, the fact that maybe red meat and, and, and butter and lard aren't going to kill us after all. After the 40 years, we've been told that they were going to put us in the ground early. And really good, and it illustrates kind of what Dr. Clay is saying, I think, that well, sometimes we don't know what we don't know, and sometimes what we think we know is, well, wrong. So, good questions. So, questions from the audience. Really good discussion so far. Let's open it up here. 
Middle, middle aisle. Thank you. Uh, perhaps panel two, but uh, I'm a scientist and work with scientists. What is the role for scientists to uh, be engaged in this, and where should they be engaged uh, to help the discussion and move forward? I got a panel full of scientists here. What do you think, guys? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually. We talk about the millennials and their access to information. I think we've got to be right in the middle of it, but I'm actually really encouraged that I think we're going to see a generation that's used to being able to come up with their own assessment and their own perception, their own belief based on access to all this information that anybody can get at the tip of their fingers. And so I think we just need to be talking about and engaged in, I'll say, less formal discussions than you would have in a classroom, but being participant in uh, of the, these kind of chat sessions or a panel discussion where they're going to have access to information. They're going to challenge you whether your statement's accurate or inaccurate. So I think you're going to expect that there's going to be a lot of honesty and integrity in those discussions. And I can tell you that we spent some time with the, uh, the Ag Alliance Aggies. Uh, uh, we hosted them within our organization. And uh, one, our hour meeting turned into a three-hour meeting. And two hours of that was absolutely just rapid-fire questions that were fun to ask and fun to answer because they do have access to all this information. And I actually think that's going to be a huge benefit. I don't think they're going to be as susceptible to single opinions, and, and, and they're very, going to be very comfortable going in and, and coming up with their own opinions. And so I'm, I'm going to be happy to participate in those discussions with them. Uh, I, would, I would follow up with, I've been fortunate in my career, which is 35 years old now, to be through three evolutions of being a scientist. The first one was being an academic scientist and, and doing independent research and being very focused on p-values and and the very rigorous approach to science and the second one was moving to industry and and at that point being very much engaged in making sure science is adopted um, at least science that is proven to be uh, safe and effective the third one is only very recently and that's being a scientist in our scientific affairs group which is part of our corporate affairs group and um, really can what it comes down to is we as scientists and it was said earlier by one of the earlier panels we have our own jargon and it's amazing what we say which becomes everyday language to us we have to learn how to speak on how the rest of the public understands what we're saying and I think that's the biggest change for me is to learn how to to speak in everyday language um, to get the point across huge words have consequences I think discovery is one area where I think science could be important. We're asking questions now that we're not going to answer for. We need to be going through that process of discovery faster. We need to accelerate change because the, the problems are accelerating faster too. Uh, the other side of this, I think, is documentation. It takes about 10 years for a better practice to move around the world that's created a farm level, et cetera. In the age of information, that's atrocious. But I think part of it is that we're not documenting how those things work and why they work and getting the information out there in play faster. We've got to learn faster. Every producer in the world has to learn faster. Science should actually help that happen, and I don't think we're, we're doing it. But here's where I think, again, the, this, this current generation has it over all of us. The Buffett's just put out a book called 40 Chances. And the idea is that every farmer has 40 chances to get it right in their lifetime. Uh, so if you don't get it right this year, you got next year, and then you got the year after. Well, hell, any parent that has a kid younger than six playing computer games knows that you have 40 chances in an hour to change and reboot and start over again. And, and that's the mentality of, of, of people under 30 years old, that you have lots of chances. Just keep trying. Just keep going. That is a phenomenal lesson in life, and we're all going to benefit just to follow up on that, that's another difference between academic and industry. When I was an academic, it was uh, never do a science project that's going to fail. And truly, failure, you know, and, and yet when I went to industry, when I went to industry, it was fail early and fail fast. And because out of 100, you'll come up with three, and so learn the ones you're not going to learn. And so failure is an integral part that's not taught in academia. Yeah. Good stuff. 
buttons. Uh, yeah, toward, toward the back, right uh, on the middle aisle. And Thanks. we'll have one up front. Hi. Great discussion. My, my question concerns the impact that welfare uh, might have on um, future practices, especially in the developing world. I mean, we've all seen how uh, welfare practices that were implemented over the past 15 or 20 years in Europe have now been um, pushed in this country. Um, the millennials talked a little bit about it this morning with the issue of cage-free, and you know, there's a segment of the population around out there that wants to see chickens be able to either be out of cages or out on grass. And I was just wondering what your the panel's impressions are of um, how welfare might be might have an impact in the developing world because that's where if you looked at the map there that that the, that was put up the population growth is not going to be here. In fact, it looked like the population was going to shrink here, but. Certainly, a lot of the protein is going to have to be produced in that area of the world, and um, as people's standard of living rises, um, I'm sure that uh, their concerns about welfare will mirror those that we have now. So, I just was wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you, okay. panelists. Thoughts? Let me jump in this sense. I'm the only one not in actual animal protein, and then you guys. Um, this is. This is exactly the, the point around maximizing versus optimizing. If we maximize space at the expense of efficiency of optimizing several other things, I don't think we have animal welfare. But we've got to always, we've got to be on the same page about what we mean by animal welfare. So was, as we were creating standards for 12 different aquaculture species, how much space this, the animals would have was part of the discussion. But it became clear to us that feed conversion was actually maybe as important an uh, indicator of whether an animal was growing, thriving, etc. Water, how much water was used uh, in the life of that animal producing that animal. What's the mortality rate that's associated with different systems? What's the time to market? Is if, a, if an animal is gaining weight faster, producing more, and time to market is faster, is that not a, a, a relationship? And then finally, uh, worker health and things like that. Or what, product quality, all of those kinds of things need to be part of this discussion. It's just not so simple as space. And we've got to make the discussion a little more real that way. Brazil has four acres of, of land for every cow in the Amazon. I mean, just think about that. The most intensive producers in Brazil get uh, a cow per 0.8. So that's the difference between extensification and intensification, which is better off from an animal welfare point of view. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like sustainability. I mean, how do you define animal welfare? Um, and I take it from the question that there's some assumptions that welfare always translates into more cost. And I would argue that a lot of the welfare programs that we put in place actually translate into better efficiency and better costs. And so I don't think there's this line between it's one or the other. I think there's lots of opportunities to improve animal welfare, uh, as, as we would call it. I think that's a great question. What does animal welfare or well-being mean to the animal itself? I mean, those are some, I'll say, difficult questions and, and might involve some more research down the road. But when you start talking about managing animals and talking about efficiencies, sick animals aren't very efficient. Animals that are stressed are not very efficient. Animals that don't have the right genetic makeup to meet our efficiency standards uh, cost money. And so from our standpoint, we don't think it's really necessarily a trade-off between economic performance and welfare. I think more importantly, it's going to be what are those things that are going to be um, defined as the key aspects of welfare and where would something like fee conversion and some other things come into that mix and balance between that. Uh, something like animals in a cage or sow crates are, are one place to talk about welfare. Um, you know, antibiotics and healthy animals are another place. But I, I don't, we don't view them as mutually exclusive. In fact, we would argue that as we've improved animal welfare, we've seen improved in production as well. Uh, just to follow up, I, I would support statements from both these speakers. I would add one more piece, and that is animal welfare, a, a portion of animal welfare is the animal health of the world of the, the health of the animal and morbidity and mortality were mentioned here. Uh, one of the biggest buzzwords over the past year in sustainability discussions is the reduction of food waste. And uh, 
in our country, in North America, in the developed world, food waste is thought of as that of, of processing waste and table, table waste, which is the major source of food waste in the developed world. The developing world, which is much larger than the developed world, the major source of food waste is morbidity and mortality, pre-harvest. So not only is it about animal well-being, but it's also about food supply as well, in that it's a tremendous loss when we have morbidity and mortality in animals um, uh, of resources. So I just, it's all tied together. It's, that's why it's very difficult to pull out one of these and say, fix that one or fix that one. They're all tied together. You have to work on them all together. Um, just, uh, I felt that there was another aspect to your question, which was this uh, feeding the world and whether the welfare standards would be the same in the developing world as they are in the developed world. Um, I can tell you one of the things about traveling outside the United States that can be sh quite shocking is the willingness of people to put in place restrictions on technologies in countries where you would think they would not restrict those technologies. Africa, um, quite a number of countries have put tremendous restrictions on the use of genetically modified organisms. I, it isn't clear to me why, because I would have thought they would need them more than perhaps the European market would. Uh, the ban on antibiotics, which has occurred, antibiotics as growth motants, in India last year, South Korea three years ago, the Chinese are talking about in two more years, they're going to ban antibiotic growth motants. You know, why would that occur in China uh, when it hasn't yet occurred in the United States? Um, and I've asked people that question, and I don't know, maybe Dr. Clay would have a better insight, but they've said, we don't want to accept technologies that are less than the technologies that you have. We don't want to accept standards that are less than the standards you have. We don't want to have somebody forcing us to do something that you wouldn't do in your own country. Now, that's a perspective I never had before. Um, obviously, I wouldn't agree with the premise that it's less than, but it, it's, it's that sense that... Um, I think the welfare standards that will be implemented here or have been implemented in Europe are just as likely to go to Africa as quickly or maybe even faster or to go to uh, Asia even though both of those continents are clearly going to be where the vast majority of future animal protein consumption is going to come from. Well believe it or not the time for this panel has expired as I kind of makes me a little sad. This is a pretty great applause for these four panels. And I'm pretty sure the four of them uh, will be around after, so if you want to have more <laughs> calls, certainly you will be able to do that. If you didn't catch their Twitter handles on the screen as their uh, headshots, I encourage you to follow them uh, or their organizations that they represent online. A lot of good information shared there and a lot of good networking as well. So the mind can only absorb what the backside can endure, right? And so as such, we will take a, a brief afternoon break before you get out of your chairs. This is, I'm going back to my uh, education classes uh, know, when I was in college, right? They teach you how to, how to give clear instructions. Uh, a couple things to remember if you haven't downloaded the app already, the speaker's bios and such are already there. The break will last until five minutes till the hour. Please help us stay on time by being back in your seats at 5 till, where we will start the next panel on the antibiotics endgame. I think a discussion you will want to be a part of. All right, you're dismissed. Oh, hey, one other thing. Don't take...
One of my uh, dearest friends in the audience reminded me that I was remiss uh, in being a good moderator and reminding you to turn off your um, ringers on your devices. Uh, so if you haven't done so already, set your devices to uh, mute or silent mode, uh, uh, tingle in your pocket mode, whatever you want to think of it. Uh, so do that. That would be very good to do before the next session. And the five or six of you who have just come in, come on and uh, find your seats. Chase. And we'll get started on our next panel. A couple things that I want to make sure you're aware of. If you didn't during that break, make sure that you take part in the silent auction. Some really great things in the silent auction, and it supports the Alliance's internship program and the College Aggies Online program, which uh, I think we can all agree is a really great piece of the Alliance's portfolio. Also, if you will look on the screens as you're winding down your conversations and finding your way to your seats, you'll notice that uh, we have an amazing raffle item this year, a trip to Orlando, Florida, to SeaWorld, one of my favorite places. Uh, you can bring out your inner millennial during a nonstop fun vacation. Find a college Aggie online, if you will, and buy your tickets today. I already got mine, and I promised them that uh, when I find the ATM machine, I'll go and buy more. But here's the kicker. So the Aggies, um, Aggies, would you stand, please? Wave about. Wave your tickets. Yeah, there you go. So the Aggies you see in the back of the room, they actually are having a little contest, I just learned. And so they are fighting tooth and nail uh, to sell the most raffle tickets because the winner gets, I don't like a lifetime supply of Starbucks or something along those lines. So by all means, help the Aggies out uh, and get involved in that raffle and the silent auction. Thank you, ladies. As I've said more than once today, if you want to get the panelists' full bios, you'll notice I've kind of been glossing over their biographical sketches as we introduce them, and that's all in the interest of time and getting you more time to converse with the panelists. But their biographies are available on the Summit website as well as via the Summit app if you haven't already downloaded it. Our next panel is one that I think you will agree covers uh, perhaps one of the more widely discussed topics involved in food animal production these days, and that is antibiotics. What is the antibiotics endgame? Our panelists, as they will come forward, include Joe Forstoffer from Purdue Farms, Dan Kish from Panera Bread Company, and Dr. John Sticka with Certified Angus Beef. So, gentlemen, take your seats. Uh, this is another one of these panels that really spans the waterfront in terms of the role that and the food system, the different stages of the food chain, and we'll have each of them kind of give a brief uh, overview of their position and we'll kind of follow their, what they do in the world. Uh, we'll follow the same format that we followed the last few you know, Make some opening remarks, introduce yourselves and um, your take on this question of the antibiotics endgame, and then we'll dive into questions. Dr. Sticker, let's start with you. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. The uh, uh, It's been interesting to see and take in a lot of the comments that have been made, and I think, in, as in many cases in events like this, there there does tend to be a shared appreciation, I think, for the positions that take on these particular topics, and uh, a bit of redundancy at times in terms of what we think the issue is, but the challenge always remains is how do we go about solving these, these things that are put in front of us as an industry, as a community. You just very quickly as an introduction to you know our thought process or my thought process on this particular topic, I'll t share with you a little bit about who we are as a company, uh, what our position is on on branding, and um, and then I'll uh, try to save as much time for questions and uh, and so forth. You know, if you're not familiar with Certified Angus Beef, we're a branded beef company. We were started in 1978. Uh, unlike some of the other players and, and participants that you've heard from, uh, we don't really own anything. We don't own cattle. We don't own beef products. What we own is the Certified Angus Beef brand, and uh, we own that brand on behalf of uh, the 25,000 registered Angus breeders that make up the American Angus Association. Uh, in our structure, we're a not-for-profit organization. And we're owned by a not-for-profit organization. And what our role is is to, to build equity in that brand 
by governing its specifications and then ultimately being in charge of the messaging that is used by uh, our 16,000 licensed partners around the world to leverage the value of what that brand means in the eyes of consumers to create value throughout the entire merchandising and production chain, ultimately to create more value for registered Angus cattle back in, in rural America and North America as a whole. And so, like I said, we, we started in 1978, and as it relates to messaging, our messaging to consumers has been very consistent for the entire 35 years of our organization. It's been centered on taste. Uh, the certified Angus beef brand has been positioned as a premium brand uh, to consumers, both domestic and internationally. And as a result, we focused on taste as the primary reason why produce or consumers uh, choose to, to purchase beef over other proteins. And that's been our calling card and our, our consistent drumbeat since the brand was started, as I mentioned, a number of years ago. Yeah, but over the course of time, things change. And they change what they're looking for. They change what they value. Uh, taste is still towards the top of the things that uh, bring consumers back to any given food item, uh, taste and cost. But along with that, there become these other extrinsic factors that determine quality in the eyes of a consumer that, uh, that have come into the marketplace. And, and our customers, our retailers and food service partners who, um, uh, who depend on this brand, who have taken ownership, so to speak, of this brand as part of their business model, depend on us to make sure that the messaging stays relevant with what their guests and their shoppers say they need. And so, you know, as an organization that's owned by producers or ranchers and farmers and cattlemen, uh, we are at still at times required through the way we're put together in our partnerships throughout the production merchandising chain to make sure that we're not just relevant in our, in our approach and our messaging to the needs of producers, but that we stay very much relevant uh, and uh, useful to the needs and demands of every segment along the line clear to the consumer. And so over the course of time, in 2004, uh, we added a, actually in 2000, we added a brand extension. We actually stayed within that taste and quality component and added certified Angus beef brand prime to our arsenal of brands that we go to market with. Uh, obviously, if you understand USDA quality grades, it's simply an adjustment uh, in the marbling specification or, or the taste component to provide a, a prime component as opposed to uh, the traditional uh, certified Angus beef. But in 2004 was the first time that we really felt a need because our partners at retail and food service demanded that we offer this option to migrate into the production claim component of, of branded beef marketing. And in 2004, we, for the first time, we offered a brand extension that entailed some of the things that go on at the farm and in the feedlot that consumers were asking questions about and launched our certified Angus beef brand natural brand extension. And as we're all aware, natural is a, uh, is a, uh, a term that's, that it has a very uh, clear definition is, uh, by USDA, minimally processed and artificial ingredients. And what we found, and I think what most of us believe, is that the consumer has a different impression of what the term natural might be. And so what we put in place when we started that in 2004 was what we felt was in line with consumer sentiment around the category. And, and, and others in the category uh, also tend to feel this way, that it's really a never, never, never program. Cattle that have never been given supplemental growth promotants, cattle that have never been given antibiotics, and cattle that have never been fed uh, animal byproducts. It was really the production definition for the natural category. And, you know, as you might expect after being in the branded beef business with a very uh, specific brand, for quite some time, we had concerns about whether or not that would having a, a natural line would impact uh, our approach with uh, what we would call traditional. Our concern was others would call unnatural product line that we had for so long. And what we found over the course of time is, in all honesty, uh, shoppers shopped their, their wants and needs. They didn't shop necessarily across the category. One didn't disparage the other. And in part because when not being fully vested solely in the natural, no antibiotic front in, in the meat case or on the menu, you know, we didn't want to disparage ourselves. So we were very clear and pointed in the fact that we felt both of them 
were extremely wholesome. Both of them were safe. Both of those brand, the brand, the traditional brand and the extension were products that they could rest assured were going to taste well. But if you valued this production system, we wanted to provide you an option. Because at the time, our, our retail partners and food service partners were, uh, were getting requests to, to offer a product line, and we either needed to fill that need, or they were going to fill that need you know, with, other, with other options. And so, you know, I wish I could tell you that we migrated that way because we had the foresight to see that it was something we just needed to do. The reality is, is that they told us we needed to do it, and so we responded by providing a product that we felt met that need yet didn't disparage what our brand and what our organization had been based on traditionally for, for the, the prior decades. And uh, I can tell you it's been, it's been a success in the ability to market those brands separately. We have found that they're different shoppers as it relates to the antibiotic component. And uh, you know, today our approach is very clear. Our approach is not about uh, this or this being better or worse than the other. It's about choices. And what we have found is that over the course of our existence as a brand, as we offer choices, we tend to win. Not just as a brand, but, but as, as Angus breeders, as retailers who are partnered with our program, as restaurateurs and distributors offer choices, uh, we tend to find ways to win in the eyes of the consumer and in the eyes of business. And uh, it's been something that we would say has been a success. Now, I, I don't want to blow it out, out of proportion. Um, you know, we do uh, uh, about 860 million pounds of business a year. 98% of that is traditional. 2% is is brand extension. And so, to keep things in perspective on on where we're at, and so uh, as a program. Now, as it relates to millennials, I'll make one comment and and then pass the pass the microphone on is that you know, the millennials, what we have found as it relates to brand messaging, have made our job a lot harder. They've made our job a lot harder because as an organization who is accountable to, to every segment of production and every segment of merchandising because of the ownership at the cattle level and the dependency of our brand to be successful at the merchandising level, we, we are required to serve all needs. And so, in some cases, it's a it's a need to be. Uh, I, I'm going to use the defend why we do things on science at the production level, but also be be aware and alert and re, and and responsive to the needs that may or may not be be emotionally based or science based at the consumer and end user level. And so, what we have found is, I think, a very nice balance. Uh, in terms of way, the way we've tried to establish and address the antibiotic issue uh, with uh, uh, you know, our, core, our core customer base and obviously millennials moving forward, and that's one of balance and, and openness and honesty. It's an effort to try to be genuine uh, in the messaging. It's an effort to definitely answer their questions. As it's been shared multiple times, millennials are engaged in the topic. And as I said, being engaged in your food and where it comes from and where it, how it's produced uh, definitely creates and makes a lot more work for, for those of us in terms of messaging and trying to adapt to those changing needs. The one thing I'll tell you is as we've been engaged with the millennial generation is they expect more from us. And I think that's a good thing. What I've also found is when you provide them with the information they're looking for, you establish the trust that we need to be successful moving forward. And this is a generation that I feel maybe it's a good thing they don't just question what we do on the production side, they question what we say on the marketing side. And when you provide them with information that's genuine, that's factual, that's complete, even if we don't know all the answers, uh, it's a generation that I think is going to be very, very positive for the future of red meat consumption. And because uh, this is a generation that, that, that is very, very willing to buy our product, to engage our product, to consume our product, and as a brand, we get very excited about this millennial generation because they, they challenge us for us to get better, and I believe the reward will be is that they're going to deliver you know, market share, I think, moving forward if we approach them with a genuine approach to give them what they want and respond openly and transparently. Great thoughts, John. Our, uh, our next panelist probably worked as hard as anybody to get here today. He's, uh, like many of us had a number of travel-related woes, and so we were really tickled we were able to actually get you here and uh, that we were able to rejigger the schedule to get you on the panel. Dan Kish 
is Vice President of Food for Panera Bread. Dan, your turn. Thank Bye. you. Everybody, I'm very happy to have made it. Uh, it was touch and go for a while. <laughs> uh, you all travel a lot, so you know what it's like. Um, well, first of all, I think John looked at all my notes. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll keep it simple. You know, I, I'm a chef by trade and by craft. I was trained and grew up that way. Um, but there's no chefs in my family. So there's actually, on my mother's side, she was raised uh, on a farm. And then my father raised me as he was raised very poor, on not an actual farm farm, but on a place that sustained itself because grandfather was a coal miner immigrant from Hungary. So what, what I find interesting now in my life, which I didn't know any of this, trust me, this is not a glory story here. I didn't know any of this when I was growing up. I wanted Twinkies and no one would give them to me. Okay, I didn't know any better, but I grew up fairly antibiotic free. I grew up on foods that were raised without antibiotics, pesticides. I mean, now that would be a real luxury. Um, to them, that was called getting by. So what was interesting about this, and, and John mentioned the word taste, um, so much of what we do at Panera is rooted in taste, and some of the reasons, well, actually, all the reasons we do the things we do begin with taste, but when it comes to, and the reason I'm here today on the panel to discuss uh, antibiotics, is we made a move 10 years ago at Panera to convert our chicken to antibiotic-free, vegetarian-fed, never ever. And at the time, that for a restaurant chain of our size, it, um, it, it, was, it was not normal. Uh, I think it's becoming more and more the norm today. Um, but it had nothing to do really with antibiotics in the initial conversations. We said, our chicken doesn't taste very good. Hmm. So what do we do about that? Well, we need to find chicken that tastes good. Chicken that tastes like chicken. And in setting out to do that, it turned out that, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw the name out there, most of you know, uh, we started it with Bell and & Evans. And it's because the Bell & Evans chicken really tasted good. And it wasn't any more than that. It was, it was about taste and not about buzzwords. And we've really tried to stay true to that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going on 10 years with the company myself. And as um, more commonly called the head chef, um, I'm asked to make sure everything tastes good. And we have a simple construct that we follow um, that it took years to develop uh, where we stopped reacting to the individual sort of crisis of the week in the food world, whether it be trans fats or sodium or this or that, and try to take a more global look at all of our food and, and give ourselves a lens and a sort of some guidance as to why we have things on the menu and why we don't. Uh, taste always comes first. We try to be give. We try to make sure we're very transparent about what is on the menu. Well, you know, an example of that is when we were the first to, one of the first big companies to go nationwide with um, uh, with calories on the menu. And I know calories don't say it all, but boy, they're they're a good indicator. Um, and and also we're we're rooted in soup, sandwich, and salad. And you know, our salads are mainly vegetables with a little bit of protein. Um, and we try to, we take a lot of care to make sure that they're, you know, they're harvested in ways that retain their freshness. And we have our, a unique system of delivering fresh dough, you know, fresh bread dough to every cafe every day. And on that same bread truck rides the lettuce. And actually the tomatoes ride in a special sort of cocoon where they don't get too cold. We try to keep them in the ripening phase. And we go to a lot of extents to, to deliver taste to the customer in a natural way. So we think that clean and natural and simple are our best foot forward. And, and the less actually we do the food, the better. So I'll just kind of stop there because I know we have a lot to get to. We do, Dan. Uh, great to have you here with us as part of the panel. Uh, and our third panelist uh, so is a native Ohioan like me. We, we had that uh, in common. Grew up uh, in Buckeye State. John's a transplant at Ohio and lives in Worcester, so I guess uh, we'll, we'll say three out of four ain't bad. And Dan, if you ever get a chance to come to God's country or something, then maybe we'll, we'll let you be a temporary Buckeye for the day. Uh, Joe Forstover is with Purdue Farms, the director of corporate communications for Purdue. And 
Uh, Joe, I won't mention um, that while you got your one degree in Ohio, your other came from a, 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 another school outside the traditional Midwestern football footprint, which I'm so fond. So uh, take it away, Joe. Okay. Um, I think you're going to hear that we, we have a lot of shared opinion across here. Um, from a communications perspective for Purdue, when we look at what is the end game of antibiotics, we really look to answer that the same way that we do many of the other questions we get about animal agriculture and, and food production. And that is, it is an opportunity for us to build stakeholder trust in the way that we operate our business. And it's an opportunity, equally important or more importantly, to increase consumer confidence in our products and to build a higher level of trust in the way that they're produced. Now we know that stakeholder attitudes are, are, are changing quickly and those preferences are shaped by a number of factors and not all of them scientific or even fact-based. Um, my uh, grandparents are also Hungarian and when I was a kid it was Pillsbury um, space food sticks and tang. Those were the things I, I craved which definitely shows that I'm not, I'm predate the millennials. But um, you know, when you think about it, those are some of the products that epitomize food science and processed food. You know, my mother had all these great European recipes, sending garden in the backyard, all this wonderful cooking that is the authentic stuff that people wanted now, and I wanted goop in a tube. <laughs> you know, and there was something great about TV dinners. You know, those shiny, those shiny aluminum trays. I mean, especially if you were sitting down watching Lost in Space. Well, you know, obviously times have changed. And as we're finding, food and science are two words that oftentimes consumers don't like hearing together. We know that what they're really looking for is a deeper connection to their food. Natural choices, authenticity. You, you hear those same phrases a lot. Now, these are feelings. They're not fact-based, but they are very important. And we have to recognize that that's a big part of what's driving the current debate on, on food production, including antibiotics. Now, that can be frustrating for a lot of us in this room because we know why we do things. But if we don't respect the feelings of consumers and other stakeholders, they're not going to respect us. And what we're finding is we can't speak to them as if we're arguing policy issues. Even if their feelings aren't rational, they're still valid as feelings. Now, those stakeholder groups are shaped by a lot of different personal beliefs, whether you're a millennial, a generation Xer, a boomer, your peer groups, a whole sphere of economic, political, and social, and environmental points of view, all which are becoming amplified through social media and through that ability to self-select where you get your information from. All of those weigh in. And what we're finding is that consumers are no longer defined by traditional demographics. The old, you know, certain income, certain age, certain lifestyle, this is the product they want. Instead, they're, they're looking at a lot of other attributes. So we now have multiple brands at Purdue Foods in addition to the, the Purdue brand that many of you are familiar with. So we have the Purdue brand, which has USDA process verified programs, including an all-vegetarian diet with no animal byproducts. We went to the all-vegetarian diet for much the same reason that you mentioned. We found that it tasted better. We found that our chicken wasn't tasting as good as some of the competition. We found when we took the animal byproducts out for us with our chicken, it produced a better tasting chicken for our consumers. We have no antibiotics ever and organic products under both the Harvest Land and Coleman Natural labels. And this includes organic chicken and no antibiotics ever, chicken, turkey, and pork. And we have local brands out on the West Coast. And these are truly local brands. These are the, you know, they're raised locally. These are for people who really, these are, I don't know if you've ever seen the Portlandia episode. If you haven't, Google it. There's this great Portlandia episode. We're, we're going to watch it tomorrow morning during my segment of the program, okay, actually. Okay, great, great. That is very close to the reality of some of those consumers that we have. As you heard before, we support consumer choice. We don't believe there's one right way to produce food within our company or necessarily within the world. But we do believe that within each of our production methods, 
we need to produce, process, and distribute that food responsibility. And inherent in that responsibility is transparency to all of our stakeholders. And we have a corporate responsibility platform that we believe in responsible food and agriculture. And the big part of that is the corporate responsibility report that we just we just issued our first one a year ago. We're putting the next one together where we demonstrate the things that we're doing and not just the statements of, of beliefs. But we also value that that transparency should support debate. Now we feel that if we go into any discussion on any issue, including antibiotics, with the sole goal of defending the status quo, we're setting ourselves up for failure, but we're also missing a potential opportunity. Do the questions that we get from consumers and even from our critics challenge our conventional thinking and ask us to reassess our practices? And what we find is we have to ask ourselves if what we're doing is defensible and equally important because we deal in a consumer space, explainable. And then, is there a better way? So to us, changing to meet consumer expectations is a form of progress. Now, more than a decade, we realized that it was becoming increasingly difficult to explain to consumers why healthy animals needed to receive antibiotics and why we needed to use certain antibiotics that were extremely important in human medicine. So one of the first steps was to eliminate fluoroquinolones, which we did well in advance of the government mandate. Now after about a dozen years of focused effort, we've gotten to the point that we've completely eliminated the use of human antibiotics, except when a veterinarian diagnoses an illness on a farm. So that includes taking antibiotics completely out of the hatchery, now, within the, our conventional growing programs, we do use ionophores. And this is something that's hard to explain to consumers, but it's a, it's a class of antibiotics not used in human health. They're not grown like traditional antibiotics are, but they are considered an antibiotic. Um, but that's an important way of, of, of treating a common intestinal illness in chickens. There are non-antibiotic alternatives, but they're much, much more expensive and limited availability right now. But those chickens will not receive any other antibiotics unless there is a diagnosed illness on the farm and then only is prescribed by a veterinarian and only is medically appropriate for the disease. Today, approximately 5% of our flocks receive a prescribed antibiotic treatment. Now there is a misconception at times that no antibiotics ever and organic programs until withholding treatment. But our own grazing programs and the standards of the National Organic Program require the use of, of antibiotics when medically appropriate for humane treatment. Of course those animals would be removed from the no antibiotics ever or organic program. All this brought us to a position that we feel for our, our brands and our consumers is defensible. We recognize that there is significant concern over the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture. We believe that antibiotics should not be used in animal agriculture in ways that contribute to the risk of antibiotic resistance in humans. We agree that human antibiotics should not be used for growth promotion to increase production or as a substitute for responsible animal husbandry. As part of our commitment to the humane treatment of the animals in our care, we do believe that it is important to treat flocks or or other animals when there is an illness that is best managed through antibiotics. And when that treatment is appropriate, we don't use the antibiotics that are generally considered important in human medicine, and those are those that are, are closely associated with antibiotic resistant bacteria and infections in humans. Now that can be a lot to explain to some consumers, so that's part of why we have the other brands. If, if they're concerned about antibiotics, but don't want to get into all this, the simple solution is to offer a no antibiotics ever option. Now these decisions are driven by the desire to be trusted because we are a consumer facing company with branded products. We need to be able to explain our practice to stakeholders and be willing to reassess those practices when we can't. Now I do, I think it was Tamara made a comment about those evil marketers and we, we've had references to that in some of the things that we've done on our packaging and advertising. Well, I wish that I could say that my cube farm mates over in the marketing stalls were that disruptive, 
but we are really responding to things that are out there in the consumer space. We're not inventing these things. These are things that consumers are telling us that, they're, that are valid or that we're going out and doing consumer research and they're saying, you know, we go through hundreds of different attributes in consumer testing and we'll get different consumer groups saying, that gives me an intent to purchase. Those are the ones that we go for. So it's not, as you've heard before, it's not about disparaging one over the other. In fact, with different brands, we can't do that. We do believe in consumer choice. It's not a matter of saying one thing is better than another. You know, is no antibiotics ever better? That's not a debate we're going to need to. We do feel that we have to have a res what we define for us and our constituents as responsible use of antibiotics. We need to have that, but it's not a matter of saying that one is better than the other. It's better if that is what that consumer wants. It's better when it's better for that consumer. Um, but you know, we know that if we don't listen to our stakeholders, someone else will. And as a branded company and ultimately as a a company that markets agricultural products to consumers, our survival depends upon listening to those consumers. That there are probably a lot of uh, questions, comments, ideas, thoughts that are percolating among the members in the audience. Certainly one of the bigger topics that we chose to tackle this year, and I'm excited to get the floor open for your questions. So ladies, we'll start circulating with the microphones. Remember, the rules of engagement here are that uh, all in love, right? So regardless of your personal opinion or position on the issue, thou shalt not be mean to the panelist. <laughs> In other words, uh, this is kind of the, the uh, advice my dad gave me when I was young. Don't be a jerk, you know, it's kind of good basic stuff. And remember, most importantly, because we have just about 20 minutes left in this session, we want to get as much discussion going as possible. Remember the difference between a question, a statement, and a filibuster, and choose wisely. With that, questions from the floor for our panelists. John, there in the back, why don't you take the first shot? So, try to tell us how the position on antibiotic-free kind of evolved and uh, from a consumer standpoint, and where that is today, has it changed over the period of time that you've, you've had antibiotic-free, and, and anyone can answer that? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. And, you know, our evolution towards uh, an antibiotic component to our natural line really evolved just out of the request from the customer base. You know, and this came from the customer base that we already had that was carrying basically 100% conventionally raised products uh, in their beef case. Uh, even to this day, we don't have a customer that's on our, on our natural product line that's 100% natural, antibiotic-free, that's all they offer. You know, so our evolution uh, started with just providing that choice to a, a long-term partner who was already carrying our conventional line and wanted to offer that two feet in his retail case that he was losing to, a, to some shoppers that were starting to value that production system and were going somewhere else to buy that product. And so our, our evolution and our stance on antibiotic free hasn't changed since that first pound was produced. It's an option, it's a choice. It's not better, it's not safer, it's not more wholesome, but I can assure you it tastes just as well as the conventional product we have today. Well, I would say we, we uh do you want to go around the horn here or jump in? This I'll, is a, I'll it's like jump ball in basketball. You just take a swipe at it. You need a little voice here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll say that we did it when no one was at research. I'd love to tell you it was a lot more thoughtful than that. But again, it goes back to the taste thing. But what we did realize very quickly is that people responded exponentially. So the reaction to offering something that was raised without antibiotics and in tandem with it tasting better than what we had been serving, and this is us against us, got a, a visceral good reaction from the consumer, and we said, "Woo! if they like this, maybe they'll like that. And it just became part of our progression to you know, always be making things better uh, than what we were doing in the past. So this is about 
we, we like to say it's very cliche, I know, but it's a journey, not a destination. And maybe someday our menu will be entirely antibiotic free. It's entirely possible. We talk about it all the time. We're not in a position to do it today. We wouldn't do it just for the sake of saying it. And there's certain things in the way of getting it done, but we're working on those. But you know what? By the time we got there, there'll probably be something else that's an issue, and we'll deal with that too. So it's more about our holistic look in this journey about the food we serve and wanting to respond. You know, you always want to give the customer something they didn't know they needed, and in a good way. <laughs> and and when you do that, they tend to react positively. So that's that's kind of how we got into it and kept going with it. And, and I want to hear Joe's thoughts, but Dan, I have a quick follow-up because yeah. you use you talk about taste as being part of this decision-making process, and mm -hmm. and it sounds like a great way to make a decision. If food tastes better. I certainly want that as a customer. So talk to me about how you defined and or quantified as part of that decision-making process. And I, I you didn't just wake up one morning and say this probably takes, tastes better. Let's go that way. How how did what was the process? by which you said, you know what, I think this tastes better and here's how we're going to verify that. Well, it, it actually, I may have mentioned this before, it had nothing to do with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. It really had to do with the, the whole process of how the birds were being raised and what they ate and the, the conditions they were raised in. And that, we think that collectively, it just so happened that they were also not raised with antibiotics in a in that situation and we try to look at the sources where our food comes from and and we find typically that the the simpler and the more natural the process of them coming to be gives us something to work with now to be clear we, we don't just take the chicken and serve it you know it has to be cooked it has to be cooked properly it has to be handled through the distribution system that we live with. It has to be handled at the cafe by the associates who we hope are carefully putting things together in a way that the outcome is this great product that we started out you know, designing and hoping would make it to the consumer. And we have to get a lot of things right beyond just the raw material. But if you start with poor, the bad word, it's not poor raw material. If you start with a, a, an ingredient that is of poor quality, regardless of whether it's a vegetable or fish or meat, it's hard to get it out the other end being great. If you start with great stuff and don't mess it up, it, it typically comes out really good and people like it. Okay. Joe? Yeah. Ours was somewhat of an, of an evolution, uh, which it had to be because we do produce the chickens. And it really started this is about a dozen years ago, and it started with something that wasn't an antibiotic, Roxersone, which is better known as arsenic. And there's a big difference between the chemical and the organic arsenic, and you know, getting all that. But we realized that it was something that can, you know, it was once people started calling it arsenic, it's like, okay, that's really hard to tell consumers. Don't worry, the chicken you're buying ate arsenic. It's good for it, no matter what the science was and the health and everything else. And as we took arsenic out, well, you know, ahead of the curve, because as a brand, we, we need to be in the leadership position, we took that out. Well, we had to develop changes to our practices so we didn't need to rely on that. When we saw where the debate was going around fluoroquinolones and, and some of the concerns in the health community about that and decided the responsible thing to do was to take that out, Again, we had to learn, okay, how do we manage without this tool? So that took, took us to the point of, okay, let's start moving away from the growth, using antibiotics for growth promotion and using them continuously in the feed. And again, you, we had to learn management practices. And we found that you become better at what you do when you don't have these tools. When you're not using them as crutches, but you're really looking at getting back to your basics of animal welfare and animal husbandry, you don't need them as often, and you're able to pull things away. So then that got us thinking, well, could we go no antibiotics ever? And that was because we knew there was a market for that. 
So we started the Harvest Land brand, and that was a learning experience for us in developing those, again, developing the, the practices so that you didn't have to rely on the antibiotics. And then we could take those learnings and apply that back to the Purdue brand to further reduce antibiotics to get where we are now. And that was a 12 year, that was a 12 year journey. So it's not something you can't just go in there and say to, to agriculture, okay, we need you to cut antibiotic use way down or only to this and expect it to happen immediately because you do have to develop those practices. You, you do have to learn to manage without it. And I think that's one point I do want to make is I don't think there's a debate about should we use antibiotics or not use antibiotics. You don't have people saying we want them completely out. Well, you, maybe you have a few fringe people out there. You always got fringe. But the movable and sensible middle and the ends of the movable and sensible middle aren't seeing this as a never ever versus you know unlimited use. What people are looking for ultimately in that end game is going to be something that consumers are comfortable with that maintains humane, healthy animal standards. And where that spectrum falls for different different companies and different consumer groups, that may vary. Okay, good good question to start us off. Let's right up here to the front right. We get a my my right, please. Hello. Recently, there was some research released on millennials' preference in buying and preparing meats, and uh, the report said that they are out buying less meat because they don't know how to select it, and then they don't know how to prepare it once they get home, uh, and then therefore they're eating out more often. How would all of you address that? Your thoughts, comments, I guess, on what's, like, how it's evolving, I suppose. Well, I think everyone should know how to cook a chicken, but they don't. So uh, we benefit by that. They come to our restaurants and eat a lot, and they come on a regular basis. And, and our research would tell us that this, this uh, Thing called a millennial. By the way, I have raised my own couple of millennials already. Well, they're not raised, but they're old enough to be in that category. It's fascinating. Um, there's so much food interest in, or so much interest in food. You know, I have kids who they watch it on TV, but they never do it. And, and they said, "Well, Dad, you, you know, you watch that show, and you've never climbed that mountain." So I guess it's <laughs> it's it's in some ways it's it's entertainment. But when it comes to us being human and getting hungry and eating, um, one of the ways to, it, to get to your question, uh, one of the ways we're dealing with it is, well, we're trying to offer things that we think provide a balanced and nutritional uh, offering. So I think this notion of eating less protein or animal protein is, is with us and will continue, and probably for good reason. Um, I, I, I'm a, you know, I eat everything. Uh, but I find myself even eating a little less meat. But the meats I eat, I like the quality. I, I go for quality over quantity. Um, we're working on a program uh, that's that we're testing in, I don't know, a dozen or so grocery stores right now where we're offering some of the core ingredients that make Panera special in a way that's usable for the home. Uh, we'll call it Panera at home. And where folks who take our ingredients home and we give them some sort of help with what to do with it, but we would hope that people would get creative with that. So if we have this great uh, antibiotic-free, all-natural, sous vide cooked uh, roast turkey, and it's just, I mean, I can't cook it any better in my own house. This We've really dialed into this and offer it in a small format where people can have that same quality at home. And again, some, some help to know what, hey, how would you use this at home? We think that may be an inroad to help people eat better at home. Um, and we've got a, we're very fortunate. We don't take it for granted. We have a, a brand that, that a lot of folks trust. You know, there's a lot of folks trust our food. And in the sea of grocery store aisles, you know, sometimes it's hard to navigate. Like you said, they're not sure what to buy. So therefore it's, whoa, you know, it, it can be a little off-putting. So we're trying to help that along at home as well as at the cafe. I think one, one thing I might add to that is I think the idea of uh, consumers not necessarily knowing how to prepare our products in the protein category and especially in beef, 
uh, is is isn't isn't uh, isolated to the millennials. Uh, it's my generation. It's it's a lot of, lot of consumers out there. Compare beef like uh, like our grandparents did. And so I think uh, we would tend to take that millennial generation and pull them into an overall need to have dialogue with them about preparation or convenience and so forth uh, and uh, wouldn't necessarily take that group separate, with the exception of th this is a, a generation or a demographic that the studies would indicate love to grill. And uh, this could be the generation that truly solidifies the grill as a year-round cooking appliance uh, that uh, you know we, we begin to see today. And so that's clearly an approach that we're taking as well, obviously isolated to, that, to the beef category, uh, because, uh, you know, as it was mentioned earlier, you can, find a re you can find a survey or a study to support whatever you want, but what we're seeing is they want to buy our products in red meat if we provide them with the, the, uh, the information, the dialogue, the recipes, the approach, the comfort level to, to put the money down because it's more expensive than it's ever been. I tell you, you uh if it wouldn't be disrespectful to uh, some of our consumers, I could give you a great comedy routine on the things that we get on our 800 line of, of, of consumer questions. So yeah, it is true. The not knowing how to cook extends across a wide age group. Um, and I think you know, that's where you get into that, that consumer segmentation. We have a lot of products now that are designed simply to make it easier. Um, perfect portions, which you may have seen. It's a thin slice. Basically, you take the chicken breast and you slice it this way, so you get rid of that thick part at one end and the thin part at the other. So it cooks evenly and it cooks very quickly. The other thing consumers like about it is in its own bag and it can come pre-seasoned. So all you have to do is slice the bag and squeeze it and it slides right into the pan and they love that you don't have to touch the chicken. And they can still cook it. So there, there's that, but we're also we are seeing in food service now. You know, it was a while ago that the larger companies wouldn't wouldn't be promoting or or providing ABF products to food service. But that is a very rapidly growing segment now in in food service, especially in in things like uh, the you know the university feeding programs. So you're, you're seeing sort of two different divergent things that they want. We need to provide that to where they are. Basically, it comes down to if you want to get share a stomach, you got to get to where the consumer who has the stomach is hungry. Great question. Good responses. Uh, from the back, Dallas. Well, first, publicly, uh, I do want to recognize Dan and Pranera for coming to DC uh, with their team, their management team, to meet with all the commodity groups here. Yeah, I don't know, it was a few months ago, and spent nearly seven or eight hours uh, with the Animal American Alliance put together the team that came here, which I wished all of our customers would do that, to have a dialogue discussion, which was not an argument, but just a discussion. So. I actually congratulate Panera for, for doing that process because I think it was a learning experience on both of our parts of the opportunity to have a discussion. I guess for the panel and Panera or whatever uh, especially is the realization is we've talked about the need for choice, we've talked about the need for transparency, and we've talked about the need to have integrity in those discussions. Uh, however, we all recognize words matter, and especially category leaders such as yourself and Panera's. Uh, you know, for example, using the term "raised without antibiotics" in my view is much more effective than saying "antibiotic-free," because it lends a connotation that others have it in it. But how is it you can do that and respond to choice without degrading other segments of the business? And when we use terms, whether it be clean food, real food, or that, all of us sending a negative signal. So how is it you can respond to choice and provide a product that a certain segment of the business wants without taking the need from a marketing perspective to degrade other segments of the business? Obviously, it's tricky. Um, 
matter. We are limited to the words everybody understands, so we do the best we can. I'd say that um, choice is my, my view on choice is a lot like I woke up today and I felt like eating X versus tomorrow I'll wake up and I'll probably want something different, you know, different cravings versus what you didn't do last night. We're affected by the things, you, you know, round the clock that we do. And we're also affected by what's around us when we get those cravings. Um, we understand that, that uh, being advocates to serve the food we serve is, you know, I, I think it's it's fair to say that we we owe it to ourselves as a business, to our shareholders, and to our customers that we be thoughtful about the things we do. And and our food, our policies around food internally, and and we're going to actually start to share this with the the rest of the world fairly soon, is that we uh, we want to hold ourselves accountable for what we think is right. And, and not everybody's going to come to us. Um, it's not an I'm better than you game. Uh, these gentlemen have, have done a really good job of saying that. Um, it <laughs> I tell my wife I'll be a little late. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, no, and I'm, I apologize for losing my train of thought. The this the to get to the the question about words and and the fact that words matter. Um, I think there's a difference between communicating who you are and what you're trying to do versus being salesy or being preachy or being judgmental. And in the end, if you come from a place of integrity where you looked at the whole picture. And you said, you know, this is really what we represent, and this is who we are. It doesn't mean everyone's going to believe it or buy buy your product, but you have to stand for something. You know, if you if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. We've all heard that. We have to put a stake in the ground about who we are and what we stand for. Now, choice within a menu. Um, we're we have a fairly narrow target of price point in our operations, and and the best thing we can do, given our size and scale, is to leverage that across the number of cafes that we have to get the best prices and put that money to work to, to again, always constantly trying to be better. And, and we're often, we ask ourselves, are we trying to outbest ourselves? And it can be tiring and it can be, you know, a little maddening some days. But it's better than sitting back and collecting a check and just doing the same old, same old. So I, it, you know, you're either moving forward or you're not, and I think we, we run some risk. You know, we when you do start to tell the story, people hear it the way they hear it. They're not right or wrong either. That's just the way it occurred for them. And some of our best learnings came from messing up. I think in life that's how it works. Um, so we've gotten better because of taking a risk and telling a story, and then having people react to it and be like, "Whoa, what do you mean by that?" And it has it has made us take pause and think about the words we're using. So, the the important thing is to think about this to be thoughtful along this journey and and try to continue to make good choices. Well, I am fairly confident that uh, if I wasn't trying to keep the trains running on schedule, that <laughs> I could get another four or five or ten or fifteen audience because. Uh, Three of you have done an outstanding job on this topic, and it's such an important discussion to have. How about a round of applause for these panelists? So we've looked at a lot of different pieces of the puzzle today, haven't we? we we've talked about we've talked about how college students look at the food in their cafeterias. We've looked at some major issues in specific. But, but, but how do you spot these big trends coming down the line? That's the question we're going to tackle next with our uh, next um, speaker, who is a, a real expert on this issue, and I'm kind of excited to hear what she has to say. Uh, Nancy Cruz is president of the Cruz Company, perhaps the best known and most widely quoted menu analyst in the restaurant industry around the world. She authors Cruise Report, a column 
on trends that appears monthly in Nation's Restaurant News, uh, a sister publication to uh, us at Feedstuffs. Prior to founding her own company, she was Executive Vice President of Technomic. She was a Woodrow Wilson Fellow in Russian Literature at the University of Wisconsin and also received a Master of Arts degree from the Film School at Northwestern University. More recently, she completed coursework at the Culinary Institute of America, where she is a frequent lecturer. In demand on the speaking circuit, she's addressed groups throughout the United States and around the globe. Nancy is an active member of the Women's Food Service Forum and La Dem, and oh boy, that's a French one. I'm not going to, I'm going to mess that up, Nancy, so I'll let you do that one for me, okay? Named by LinkedIn as one of the top 100 influencers of the U.S. I'm a little jealous about that because that's really cool. She blogs regularly on food-related topics on the LinkedIn website. Most of us probably are LinkedIn, uh, and I'm hoping that maybe I can become LinkedIn. She is a real key expert in this part of our business. In her spare time, she enjoys travel, reading, eating, and movies, some of my favorite things. Uh, she says not necessarily in that order. Please welcome Nancy Cruz. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, and thanks, Julian. I'd be nowhere without my clicker. Thanks, everybody. Delighted to be here. As you can see, we're going to be talking about millennial food trends. In the interest of the short amount of time that we have together today, I'm going to be very, very focused. I'm going to talk about five as I see them impacting animal agriculture opportunities going forward. I'm going to talk about implications. I do want to say, though, from the outset, I've been monitoring trends now uh, for, for, gosh, a couple of decades. I hate to admit that, but it's true. What says, What's said in this room stays in this room. I don't believe I've ever seen a time when there is better opportunity for animal agriculture. I don't believe there has ever been a time, for as long as I've been monitoring the business, that the prospects are as bright for your products as they are today. You do have some challenges. I'm going to uh, touch on those as we talk about how to court a millennial audience. Here's my agenda. Let me start with some very good news. You all know about this. Oh, we love protein, right? We're in the middle of a boom. We cannot consume enough of the stuff. Uh, please take a look at some of this data. Retail grocery introduction, 54% in the past five years. Retail grocery is a mature uh, segment. It's been growing over the past five years, 1% to 2% a year. There are analysts who say that the two categories on the right Greek yogurt and energy bars, both of which are protein-driven categories, have been keeping the grocery segment afloat. Take a look at the restaurant numbers, also jumping very, very high. What, what, what's with protein? Well, I don't have to tell you. It represents satiety, right? We feel satisfied. It builds muscles. It gives us energy. But, but why now? Why, why now, the excitement? Well. I'll tell you if I can move forward here. Next slide, please. I think what's happening, and I've not seen data to support this, I think what's happening is you know that there are three macronutrients, right? You have proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. You know that fats are very, very uh, distressful to most consumers. They're really verboten, right? And what about carbohydrates? Oh, they're so confusing. They're simple or they're complex. They're good or they're bad, they're gluten or they're not, and who knows what gluten is, right? So that becomes an issue. What does that leave protein? It leaves it, it seems to me, the good positive macronutrient. And the bar chart says these are consumers who specifically now are looking at the labels, what they buy, to see the protein content. The opportunity to sell Protein enrichment, next slide please, going forward, um, speaks directly, it seems to me, to opportunities with the millennial uh, marketplace. Here's where the dairy uh, industry has moved. Please take a look at the nomenclature here. Protein Fight Club. Who are they talking to? They're not talking to me. They're not talking to me, folks. But they're talking to the millennial audience, and specifically the young millennial male. Restaurant chains absolutely on board with this as well. In fact, virtually all what we call QSRs, quick service restaurants, 
have built their business on catering to young male tastes. But look what Taco Bell has got in test market. Look at the nomenclature here. Power, protein, boom, right? And look what they divulge on the menu. How many grams of protein, the caloric content. This is very much not just on trend, but I think ahead of the curve. So going forward, it seems to me there's tremendous opportunity for you folks in the agricultural community, animal agriculture community, to exploit protein. This is not without some jeopardy. You know that the whole fat issue uh, has certainly gone up for grabs in the last quarter. But do pay particular attention to saturated fat. What's great about what you represent, though, is the second bullet. It's about addition, not subtraction. What does the American consumer hate? Right, here's what I hate. I hate it when I get addition. It says salt. We subtracted the fat. We've subtracted the uh, sugar. What does that mean you've subtracted, right? To respond to when you've put something really good in. Nutrition and protein pack. Uh, watch for backlash. Watch for backlash. You know that when anything is hot, as protein is hot, there are going to start to be now counter forces uh, generated and all that kind of stuff. Stay tuned into it. And do expect some change. <laughs> but there are some scientists who say we, we need to up uh, the protein requirements, particularly not so much for millennials, but for aging baby boomers. So keep an eye on that. And think also about gender segmentation. Have you guys seen this? Uh, do you know, Brogurt is not the, 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 the brand name, but I love the expression Brogurt. This is yogurt now, positioned specifically to a young millennial male. Who, who in the grocery store talks to young men? Nobody except the beer folks, right? If you want, right? If you want to sell Greek yogurt, who do you sell it to? Well, according to Jamie Lee Curtis, a bunch of middle-aged women with digestive problems. What is that? <laughs> Please. So, so now look what we've got here. The brand name is powerful. You can see it on the package. It's not a little, this little tiny four. It's a manly. This is eight ounces, and my my little lady hand could hardly hold on to it. Look, it's black, and can you see the iconography? It looks like a steer. Did that yogurt really come from that steer? I don't think so. And, and but, <laughs> but here, and it says 25 grams of protein. There's going to be more of this kind of stuff going on as you segment the millennial audience. Do pay attention for opportunities. Here's another uh, potential opportunity. It seems to me it's certainly uh, on in the food world, and that is the whole phenomenon of snackification, which speaks to the fact that we're all so doggone busy 24-7. We're all wired. Millennials, in particular, are not tethered to the notion of three square meals a day. right? So the bar charts say that 52% of Americans now say that they will replace a meal one to three meals a day with a snack. So we're snacking in lieu of meals. Only 10% of consumers on this chart say they never snack. Now, millennials are super snackers. They're not the only ones, please, who are time crunched. But certainly, they are absolutely multitasking. And they were raised on the notion of convenient food on demand. They have perfected the art of grab and go. And they value fresh, real, and less processed foods. Quickly off the slide, they also value over-the-top crazy, right? And they'll continue to. You all know that KFC just reintroduced the double down. You know what that is, right? No bun, two fried chicken breasts with all kinds of stuff crammed in between. That's going to this audience as well. So, so you've got this bifurcation, but absolutely fresh, real, less processed. Here's an entrepreneurial group uh, that's been getting an awful lot of press. This was from the Wall Street Journal, Nature Box. Two young tech guys. They are millennials themselves. This is bypassing conventional uh, retail distribution. This is home delivery now of snacks. They're at about $3 million in sales. You allow the, and it's a millennial audience primarily, to customize. They have 120 different options. You pick between oh, 20 and $50 worth of options. Once a month, you get it delivered. And in the meantime, they are building a huge uh, database that they expect to mine 
for uh, further adventures in the food business. The opportunity exists also if we're talking about conventional retailers, whether it's grocery store retailing or supermarket retailing, to move on to the next generation of protein snack. In other words, we've already got the yogurt and we've got the snack wraps on the restaurant side. Well, what, what's, what's next? I mean, you've got to push now forward in terms of getting a better distribution on, on newer products. What's it going to be? Protein plus something, maybe? Protein and veggie or protein? Is it going to be a specific kind of, of functionality? Will it be a different kind of delivery system? I don't know. But I do want to tell you, I think that there's opportunity going forward. Now, the community is you need to rethink your center of the plate mentality. Right? I mean, I think most of you think in terms of the now we're talking about rethinking, packaging, portioning, even positioning. When you're considering that second generation product opportunity, what's next, remember the emphasis here because you can deliver it all. Millennials want good and they want good tasting. You've got nutrition, you've got flavor, you can deliver on convenience. The last point though here I think is something to watch. It's easy to get caught up in sort of the trend of the moment, and snackification is a big trend. It's not a flash in the pan. But recognize that the millennials, the folks that you met on the stage here earlier today, have not formed households yet. Once they mature, begin forming households, to what extent will they move back to more conventional meal patterns? I don't know. I suspect that longer term you're going to see, again, I'm going to use the term bifurcation, we're going to continue in that 24-7 mode, so snack and grab and go will be important. But you're going to see a gradual re-emphasis as well on, uh, I'm going to use the term three meals a day, more conventional uh, in-home consumption too. So proteins in the plus column. Snacks, absolutely in the plus column. Uh, challenges, sure. I don't anticipate spending much time on this because you've heard so much about it already today. But I track food trends for a living. Food activism, absolutely. Um, I, I've just put some buzzwords up here, and, and I could go on for, for pages with the kinds of uh, phrases that recur. Nobody in the agricultural community knows about this better than you folks as animal issues, whether it's cage-free or gestation grades free or, or free range or whatever it is has moved to the fore and you're really being impacted at all chains of uh, at all links of the food chain right I mean you you folks that are producers are impacted and and the processors and manufacturers and all the way through uh, the retail channels as well and this level of activism will continue to percolate but as you know, Super hot button at this moment has everything to do with uh, GMOs. You know that the governor of Vermont has a bill on his desk. It's been passed there. It's the first state to pass legislation. When he signs it, it will require uh, any uh, food products that contain genetically modified ingredients to be so labeled. That's going to really be a serious hot button issue going forward because, of course, you've all been tracking what's been going on with uh, General Mills when a group called GMO Inside ran a digital campaign, hello, Facebook, hello, YouTube, who are we talking about here, right? This was millennially driven, um, getting, uh, forcing General Mills to remove genetically modified ingredients from their flagship Cheerios. Have you heard the rest of the story? In his most recent quarterly earnings call, uh, with the Wall Street analyst, the CEO from General Mills said, by the way, our sales of Cheerios are down uh, since we moved to it. Why? He, he did, by the way, he didn't say. I, I bet I can guess, and I bet that they are doing massive amounts of research, but you know why, right? Consumers don't know what a GMO is, for the most part. But they do know what it says on the package, I took something out, right? It's that subtract, you've done what to my favorite cereal? So I suspect that we're going to have a bit of a shakedown period. This is not going to go away, though, as you know, because of everything that we've been talking about so far. 
being in a wire, wired world, everybody's a journalist. We heard about mommy bloggers already once today, didn't we? I mean, this is a whole industry. There are conventions of mommy bloggers. There was a, a, a program in Atlanta, where I'm from, and it's been in the last couple of months, for $1,500 a day, the mommy could sign up and learn how to be a, a mommy blogger from people who've been very successful. Well, well, yeah, but who are these people? What are they conversing about? What's happening in their environment? I mean, the cattlemen certainly have learned firsthand um, what some of the consequences here can be. You know on the left, it's been a couple of years now since a chef on TV talked about what he termed pink slime. Uh, it went viral onto YouTube, lean, finely textured beef, LF. TV and was picked up on the right by a mommy blogger who forced the USDA to change its uh, beef practices with regard to supplying school food service. If any of you read the editorial in the New York Times, which was a real friend uh, to the cattlemen during that whole debacle, the bottom line, uh, this was an editorial page, a Sunday editorial page of the New York Times was, the only consumers hurt by LFTB the 650 people who lost their jobs at BPI. Fasten your seatbelts because this is going to be going uh, on, uh, going to be part of an ongoing uh, issue here. Uh, speaking of, of who communicates well with millennials, we've already heard about Chipotle today. I've got some screenshots here. This is from their Scarecrow, which was an ad that went digital. It was broadcast to digital last year. Uh, this year they went strictly digital with a four episode, what they call the comedy series. It's called Farmed and Dangerous. And the quote here at the top describes this comedy which takes a look at outrageously twisted, outrageously twisted and utterly unsustainable world of industrial agriculture. You folks have got to get yourself tuned into these conversations. You need to stay ahead of hot button issues, whether it's GMO, whether it's LFTB, the old irradiation mess that you've been through, and absolutely antibiotics and hormones. Absolutely antibiotics and hormones. And let's be a support of appropriate advocates and spokespeople. And by that, I don't mean anybody from the government. And I don't mean anybody from your uh, own professional organizations. You're seen as biased. Recognize what you've already heard from the stage just a couple minutes ago. Joe said, much of this is emotionally driven. Pay special attention to kids and moms. Special attention. All right, I'm going to finish with some good news. I know that's kind of hard news, but I've got some good news. This may not seem like good news going in, so just bear with me. We're in the throes of veggie chic. Oh, this is good news for you guys. Why is produce so hot? And believe me, it's very, very hot. Well, price sensitivity, a volatility at the center of the plate. There's now, by the way, some real volatility, as you all know, in the produce category as well. But volatility at the center of the, center of the plate meets all of these chefs now with all of their great ideas and consumers, are, they know consumers are concerned about health. And so how are we going to take these products that are readily available to us and lots of options and that, that, that make them attractive? I'm going to just give you three quick examples and then I, I promise to deliver the good news. Um, the biggest trend in the business right now from the vegetable point of view is cruciferous vegetable. Really? Cruciferous? Those are the veggies everybody loves to hate. You know, those are Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage. Really? How are you going to make that sexy? Well, if you're a chef, you know that the American consumer will eat anything if you put bacon and th on it and throw it on a pizza crust, right? <laughs> Any, absolutely anything. The only thing better is a bowl of pasta. Right, so, so look at this. Here we've got Brussels sprouts pizza. How else do you get the consumer to eat it? You can throw it on some wonderful crusty bread. You treat it as if it were an animal protein. Look at how thoughtful this is. Fresh moths, come on. Look at the condiments here. Oh, this is wonderful. How about this? This has been all over on the independent restaurant side of business. Everybody's been doing cauliflower steak. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but who wants a cauliflower steak, right? 
So, well, okay, you chicken fry it. Okay, well, that makes it all the much better. So, why am I so excited about this on your behalf? Well, simply because veggie innovation does not equal a rise in vegetarianism. We say that again, that's important. Innovation around vegetables, around produce, does not represent the end of protein consumption, animal protein consumption. In fact, I know you folks uh, track Meatless Monday. It's been interesting for me to see this is going into its 11th year. Powerful backers, as you know, uh, it's had a bit of a struggle. Last year, the House of Representatives formed a vegetarian caucus. They tried to do a Meatless Monday. Uh, well, no, that went nowhere. School districts, if, interestingly, I think San Diego is the largest school district now to try a Meatless Monday uh, program. They've got about 109 schools, 135,000, I think, students. If you talk to the school food service directors who have the hardest job in the world, they'll say to you, the reason I consider this is not because I have any problem with meat. It's because if I, if I give the kids meat, they will never eat produce. The only way, and you know they're under the gun in terms of childhood obesity, the only way to get the kids to eat the produce is to remove the meat. The important point, though, again, I'm talking millennials here is the last point. The majority of colleges and universities, this is where millennials live, right, uh, can't get this thing off the ground. In fact, they won't touch it. Why? You see why. Students feel like we're regulating their choices. We, we really can't afford to have that kind of protest on our hands. We've got to keep them coming into the cafeteria. It sounds like we're taking something away. Rafi Taharian at Yale Dining, a wonderful, wonderful, talented guy. He's, he's, he's actually increased the quality of the meat that they're serving. It's not a question of taking the protein, animal protein, away. This interest will increase. It, it's, it's terrific. I mean, it's just terrific because what it reflects is the desire for good, food. It reflects the desire for good food. AMI, FMI just did a study that showed, however, that meatless meals were the least popular way to save money. So when we're talking about good food and we're talking about vegetables, we're not talking about homemakers or restaurateurs cutting people off from their meat supply. Rather, what we're talking about is a shifting priority that favors foods that are seen as clean, whole and real. Clean, whole, and real. This is where you guys come into the picture, it seems to me, because going forward, we are looking at a major sea change in terms of consumer attitude and usage of foods. This is maybe the biggest trend that I've, I've seen in all the time that I've been doing this, the embrace of real food, typified, as you can see here, by butter. Ooh, everybody, isn't this great? The comeback of real butter. I'd it probably never went. This going hand in glove. I, every year I do a thing, a state of the plate. Well, last year, the ingredient of the year, eggs. I could talk to you for three days about it. I won't, but I could. Egg dishes, fantastic. Fried chicken, don't even get me started. It is exploding. It's wonderful. It's because it's real food, and it represents the way that consumers want to eat today. Nose to tail cuisine. As we move through the recession, you know that young chefs in particular began to emphasize using all of the animal. It was frugality, but it became very, very trendy. And butchers have become kind of rock stars in, in a lot of markets because they have so much in common with chefs. Uh, they, they typically, when they're seen in public, they're in wonderful, pristine whites. Yeah, here's a, on the left. This is a part of a small chain uh, dedicated uh, to, to, to butchery. This isn't going to be a huge segment, but if you go into one of these shops, you want to just weep because the, food, the meat case is so beautiful. It's like looking at jewelry. In contrast, ladies and gentlemen, to when you go into the standard supermarket, and you take a look at the meat case, and it looks like a hospital room, right? You know what I'm talking about. That's part of the, the romance here. This is part of the romance as well. The rise of farmers' markets. They've been on a strong growth curve. As of last year, the growth started to bottom out in some uh, markets. They're getting a little bit overbuilt. But it's the whole notion of the consumer now 
wanting some sort of reassurance because food has become so politicized, we're starting in some quarters to be frightened by our food. So this notion now of talking face to face with the farmer, while it's easy to satirize and Portlandia and all kinds of stuff, I understand, and I think you really can too, why consumers have been driven to this point. Um, they're also, by the way, losing their loss, love affair for the microwave. Isn't that great news? I mean, you guys have never, your products with the microwave come on, how great that they're losing favor, they're not being replaced. The strong growth curve here in terms of in-home appliances, um, crock pots and toaster ovens, because they allow the consumers a little tiny bit of involvement. Right? We're not saying, please, I am not saying we're going to go back to scratch cooking, but the notion of seeing the food, touching it, adding the egg, if you like, um, is what's been, been driving forward growth in this uh, particular category. So going forward, the definition of quality food in this country is, is changing, uh, and it's changing very rapidly. Um, it seems to me that when we talk about real foods, there are some very powerful consumer drivers, absolutely millennials. But the even better news is it's baby boomers in tandem with millennials. That's important because the baby boomers, as you know, have the pocketbook power at this point. It's also, it seems to me, great news because from your perspective, we're talking about, again, goodness without deprivation. We're talking about animal proteins that are really efficient delivery systems for protein, for flavor. That's just great news. And I think, frankly, at this point, early in the game, it's good news that there are no standards of identity. Right? We're all standing up here today saying, what does real food mean? This allows you, there is no USDA standard, to get in on the ground floor early to take control and begin to drive the definition and the conversation going forward. Major, major opportunity for you. It, it's not a road without obstacles looking, looking ahead. And again, I've got to say, get, get control of this conversation regarding antibiotics and, and hormones. Don't let yourself be ambushed by it. But by and large, I'm going to take you back to where I started. From where I sit, the outlook for your products is as powerfully positive today as it has been at any time since I have been monitoring food trends. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. I've been delighted to be with you today. Thanks, everybody. Some good news at the end of the tunnel. I, I love that. Uh, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, we've talked about butter, bacon, protein. These are some of Oh, great job, Nancy. And so Nancy's going to be part of our panel discussion now on the discussion of what millennials want versus what they buy. So I'm a wannabe economist, and we often talk about what consumers say versus what they do. And ultimately, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate decision is when you go ring the cash register, right? And yet, sometimes that doesn't line up 100% with what we say in survey data. So we're going to discuss that. So let's bring up the rest of our panel. So along with Nancy, Nancy I have Angela Anderson from the National Pork Board, Nikki Rappaport with Cabo Metze Grill, and David Fikas from the Food Marketing Institute. Join us on stage. Please welcome them as they make their way up front. Please, thank you. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, let's. Uh, we, we've met Nancy. Let's get a little brief introduction from each of our uh, additional panelists, kind of the same format that we've done before. David, let's uh, let's start with you as our fourth member of the panel gets started. Give us kind of a brief sketch of. of uh, my name is David Fikes. I'm vice president for consumer slash community affairs uh, with FMI. FMI. Association for Supermarkets and Grocery Stores and all venue of, of um, food retail. 
Uh, our members run the gamut all the way from the mom and pop grocery store at the corner of First and Front in Bucks, North Tennessee, all the way to that uh, monolith of retailers, uh, Walmart. Angela? I'm Angela Anderson, Manager of Food Chain Outreach for the National Pork Board. Um, in our role, I really strive to work with our top kind of 35 food service and retail companies, talking to just about modern pork production. What does it mean to raise pigs in America today? And it, it really using consumer language that's understandable. Part of the key tenets we've been talking about today, using real language to talk about issues that could be of concern to consumers and customers in a way that's understandable to them. And so we really strive to work with whether it's our millennial or our different um, categories that really strive to eat pork consumption to help them understand more about maybe some of those issues that are some concern in the marketplace today. And Nikki. Hi everyone, my name is Nikki Rappaport. I am the brand strategist at Kava Grill, which is a DC-based fast casual restaurant. Uh, we were born out of actually a full service restaurant that was also started here, uh, Kava Meze. We have three locations um, of, that, um, of that restaurant, another one on the way. Um, and we also have a grocery product line of dips and hummuses, spreads that we sell in Whole Foods from uh, Charlottesville up through Southern Connecticut. Um, and I oversee all of the, the marketing and brand strategy, really everything that a customer has um, their hands on or has a touch point with um, a brand experience, making sure that you know, we're communicating who we are um, and our, you know, our food and our, our values. And uh, you know, millennials are, are really our, our core target. We have in our core um, customer base as well. Uh, our, our average customer is really a 24 to 29 year old male and female split uh, right down the middle. Um, and so that comes across in all of our online and uh, mobile marketing as well as all of our in-store experiences. Um, and then in addition to all of that, I um, have a food blog as well. So um, I kind of see the food world from both sides of this. Outstanding. So let's get right into the discussion uh, here, focusing on this concept of what millennials want versus what they actually buy. Uh, and I want to start with um, Nancy's presentation. So Nancy, you, you're going to check out for a moment here uh, since you just told us all of these trends. So for the three of you who weren't speaking when Nancy was talking, listen to her talk about the trends. Which of those trends that she described are you seeing in your particular business? Uh, which ones surprise you? What, what, are, what are your thoughts on how those trends are showing up uh, among your customers? Wait, go ahead. And go. <laughs> okay. Um, again, I'm looking at super... First, what we're looking at with millennials in particular is as she was pointing out, as Nancy pointed out, that uh, they are including snacking as one of their approaches to meals. Baby boomers uh, shop and eat and plan differently than millennials do. Millennial, for instance, baby boomers are always looking at stocking uh, the pantry and looking at creating their shopping list all week long, checking circulars and such and doing some comparisons all week long as to what's missing in the pantry. Uh, when they eat, they are looking at you know three square meals you know a day uh, and trying to approach it from that direction. Even though they too snack, they don't think of snacks as an eating occasion. They still think in terms of the three square meals a day. And as a result, when they shop, they are shopping again, trying to fill the pantry. Uh, millennials do plan. I'll say that again. They do plan, but they tend to plan on their iPhones immediately before going to the grocery store. Their shopping tends to be backwards from the meal that they are planning that night, that they tend to be more immediate in terms of what they are planning for. Uh, so when they go... Uh, the stats are that one-fourth of what millennials eat was purchased just two hours before. Okay. Uh, and again, their approach is their approach is not just three meals a day, but looking at all those snacking occasions um, uh, along with it. Uh, the three meals, but also those meal occasions that 
fit in between. As a result, because they consider those eating occasions, they're more conscientious about uh, buying for those situations and also in their health consciousness are looking at the healthier alternatives and the quicker alternatives during those snacking occasions. Yeah, thank you for mentioning bacon is hot. It can probably turn a vegetarian into loving bacon at any point. Uh, but you know, kind of the ongoing protein power obviously is going to be a continued focus with pork. Um, undoubtedly, how do we engage the millennials keeping pork hot, especially in the food service right now? Uh, pork continues to be a very favorable trend. But also looking specifically with millennials is how do we really tell that socially responsible story with them as well? So whether their engagement through social media, asking more about where their product is coming from, what does it mean to be socially responsible in pork, and actually trying to actively have a conversation with them to have them feel confidence in making that decision to choose pork as that power protein. One of the things that really you know stands up for me what we were listening to before is the the idea of clean and whole food um, and people are really searching for that and they want to know more so transparency is something that we focus a lot on because we're getting asked those questions more and more. You know, whether it's an allergen question, is this gluten-free or soy-free, or I have a nut allergy, or if it's a more specific, you know, down to the nutrition level of, you know, when I build my meal and I add crazy feta onto my bowl, you know, what does that imply in terms of a caloric count? So I think responding to that and being super open about the, you know, our, our food and our transparent, you know, being transparent about it in terms of, our sourcing, you know, where we get our food, the farms that we work with, work with, the shepherds and the ranchers that we work with, and then everything down into the preparation, all the ingredients that are included, and um, how it's being served as well. And we're finding that more and more, you know, we want to give this information because it says a lot about who we are, but our customers want to know more about it too. So they're probing and they're asking more questions. And we want to be able to give that to them on their fingertips. So incorporating that information in our mobile app. So right when they're paying, uh, we have a pay lo loyalty and payment app. So you're paying with your food, uh, with your phone, and at the same time you're getting that information about the allergens and the calorie counts and all of that. So it's right there in your fingertips. So I'm um, going to Nancy and then we'll let the, the rest of the panel dive in too. So, one of the challenges that I see, again, coming back to is, is a wannabe economist and knowing that a lot of us in this industry, we're, we're scientists or we're numbers people, we're very analytical, we want definitions and details. A lot of these trends or terms get defined. We were talking earlier about sustainability. That's a tough one to define. Uh, the term clean has been used. I, I know a friend in the fitness industry is always like, you got to eat clean. How, how do you tell an audience of folks in a very production-oriented or analytical-oriented mindset how to get past worrying about the definitions to really understanding what that customer is trying to say to them, what they're wanting to buy? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I, I guess a couple of things come to mind. One is get a line on who's doing a great job with your products and take a look at what they're doing. Get yourself to Panera Bread and take a look at what the menu looks like, what the verbiage is on the menu, what are the words that they use, what does the food look like, because I think concrete examples are much more easily understood. I, I mean, we deal with this all the time. One of the big hot buttons in the restaurant business that's been driving me crazy, everybody's doing it, is artisanal. Consumers are going to pay more for artisanal. Yeah, but does, does anybody quite know what that means? But, but, but if you get yourself to Applebee's, for example, which just introduced an, a, an artis artisan grilled chicken ciabatta, get a look at the product, get a look again at the verbiage, the product, the, the presentation, what it looks like on the plate, all of that kind of stuff. I help, I think helps put some real meaning around these words that I understand because it's difficult for me. It's very difficult for you as well. Artis artisanal chicken ciabatta. Did artisanal I chicken ciabatta. Yeah, and That's its first cousin. from riblets. Wait, its first cousin is rustic. We have rustic bread. What are you 
excavated it someplace. I'm not sure what that. What is that even? But and and and, and customer, you say you, you see research. I'll pay more for rustic. What on earth does that mean? But again, much of it is emotional. It's 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 perception. But again, I think that's a great opportunity for you guys to get kind of a hold of that and help direct it. You know, at the same time, I'd say at some points we need to steer clear of some of the buzzwords and really to what the consumer is asking for. You know, this past 18 months, 24 months, we've spent a lot of time with 14 different focus groups just listening to consumers about hot topic issues in agriculture, hot topic issues in pork. What are they trying to say? How are they saying it? And trying to match their language when we're actually having a conversation about, you know, whether it's promotion of pork, whether it's talking about maybe a hot topic issue in pork, or just answering any questions really in agriculture as in general. Um, but it is really about having that dialogue with them, finding them in that middle spot, matching them with their language, and then really focusing on not just caving into those buzzwords, but really helping define the language in your own terms as well. One thing that I would add to that is um, that there's a lot of noise out there, and millennials, like all of us, are trying to sort through and decide what can be trusted, who can be trusted, what are the definitions that are operable, uh, and which ones really do work. And they're like all of us that are trying to struggle through the noise for those clear voices that we can trust. And so uh, what we're trying to do in our industry is to be the trusted voice uh, and to engage uh, in that where all the noise is, uh, to make sure that the that blogging and all of those ways in which people are beginning to enter into the public discourse, that the words are clearly defined. Um, in our industry right now, GMOs are obviously a big issue. And what we're finding that with GMO labeling is it's not so much about GMOs as it is about the labeling. That it is that they want and are requesting the information and they really do are seeking that and are seeking the trusted avenues wherein they can get the information that, they, that the consumer wants and needs. So I want to I do a follow-up. Nikki, I want to hear your take on this, but, but David, I want to... So what you said there has potential to be very profound when you're talking about the GMO thing in particular. Uh, the farm broadcasters in the room, we heard a discussion on uh, the labeling issue earlier in the week and it got very contentious and one of the concerns oh, is that you put a skull and crossbones, at least that's the fear of the label, on on a package, a Surgeon General's warning for, uh, for Cheerios or whatever it is. What, what's your take on that issue. If the consumer says to me, I want to know, I want information, and we're very information driven as we've heard all day from these millennials, we want that honesty. How, how do we deal with that and yet combat this concern that we create you know, a black, a black label? What we are advocating is that there should be a national standard to help start to alleviate some of that concern about what are GMOs. Okay? Because a lot of folks do not know. When you ask them, they may say, I'm for GMO labeling, but when you ask, well, what's a GMO? They can't give you a working definition of it. And so, number one, we're for national standards, not state-by-state -state standards. We think that's a strategic mistake and a grievous error uh, and a bad path to go down. Uh, so we're for national standards. We also think that uh, non-GMO is what should be labeled. And the reason why we as the food retail industry are for that is because we think that when our customers are coming in saying, I want a non-GMO diet, what's going to help them most is be labeled as this was produced with non-GMO products. And so that clarifies for them and allows and gives them the information. We're also, though, are saying, uh, Labeling is only one small avenue through which we can begin to communicate with the consumer the information that they want and need about the products that they are purchasing. And to put all this emphasis upon the label, and we all know there's limited real estate on that, there's much better ways to be communicating about what's in the food, how is it produced, uh, than simply relying upon the limited real estate of a label. So, Nikki, yeah, let's get back to you and, and your, your thoughts. Yeah, you. that, that but, segues really uh, well into what I was going to contribute about this is it does go beyond the label. It's it's more than just the, the tagline of the, you know, artisanal bread or the rustic bread, but 
uh, we spend a lot of time on, on content at Kava and really trying to share deeper conversations with our customers, whether it's on our blog or through social media. Um, so it's not just a one touch point that you're getting and you're learning about our juices that we make in-house every day, but um, you know, you're getting a little bit more from that. So you're getting a blog post that explains the process and how we do that and visiting the farm where we get the strawberries and meeting with that farmer and having those conversations and then monitoring what people are saying on Twitter and through Instagram posts and how they're describing it. And, you know, they might just not describe it necessarily in the same way that we might, um, but that's okay. And we can, one, learn from them and see how they might, uh, you know, view our product, but also begin a conversation with, with every customer who is who's talking about um, our product and uh, maybe steer them in a, in a direction that you know they weren't at before or educate them more about something as well. So I think the content is really a great piece that you know you can dive into things that are beyond a tagline or what's on the label and really again share information with people but also make it a conversation and that's really something that um, millennials are looking for is they're not looking for information that's just being pushed at them but they want to have a conversation they want to feel like they're part of this brand they want to feel like you value them as much as they value you and so Nikki I want to stick with you for the next question uh, so Kava is growing uh, rapidly here in the DC area great great news for you and your organization so why do you think Context we've been discussing the, the the brand the company's been so successful when uh, I look at your menu you have things um, stayed on there say so you source your animal proteins from local farmers what what does that mean what is local to you what is local to your customers and and has that played a role in the success and expansion of the brand definitely so we have five Kava Grill locations now in the DC area and uh, we're um, opening three more by the end of the summer and a couple more along the way after that. And so, yeah, we are really, you know, we're rapidly growing and we've had um, uh, some really great success so far. And I think, you know, it comes back to, you know, fast casual is a, is a huge growing market. Um, also, Mediterranean food is one of the fastest growing categories of food as well. So both of those, um, you know, are, are big players in it, you know, along with the Mediterranean food. Our, you know, our generation, my generation is very blended. We have much more sophisticated palates. Um, I think, you know, people, there was some study of like, uh, kids are starting to eat spicier foods four years earlier than they were 10 years ago. So palates are becoming more sophisticated and flavors and all of that. So Kava Grill is really well positioned in all of that. Um, we like to say that we're for the the time con conscious, the budget conscious, and the health conscious customer. So all those three things kind of intersect together. And those are the things that people are, you know, especially a 24 to 29 year old, which is our core customer, are looking for. You know, they want um, a fast meal because they're working late and they're on the run and they have a lot of people that they need to see and fit in in a day. Um, and uh, they, you know, they're on tight budgets because they're not making huge salaries yet, and they're, you know, want um, something that's healthy too. They don't want to go necessarily to a burger joint every day. Um, the great thing about our food is that it fits really well between kind of like the the all salad and like the heavy burger joints. You can really mix and match those meals. So um, if you are on a diet, you can get go the salad route, but you can also get um, a rice bowl with braised lamb and crazy feta and load up on some really great proteins and, and fill up that way as well. So we kind of run the spectrum. And the other thing with fast casual, and I think that's why it's growing so much, is you know we're trying to provide an environment that doesn't feel like we're getting you in and out so fast. It's not fast food. We want you to come and sit and have a conversation with your friends. We serve wine and beer at most of our locations you know, an experience that, you know, is more meaningful than just, you know, a quick quick dinner. Great stuff. So I want to also, in addition to some of the questions here, open it up. So if you have questions, throw uh, throw your arm in the air and one of the ladies will come around with a microphone and let's get, uh, get your questions out on the table in addition to mine. I see we have one right there in the back already. So let's just go, let's go there. 
So my question is, Americans spend in, in average 6.6 percent of their budgets with food. It's the lowest amount in the world. Uh, so where the millennials are going with that? So do you see room for probably some supermarket chains, for instance, like Trader Joe's or Whole Foods are, are, are growing? Whoa, well, gosh, the, the debate over what percent of, of our income should be spent on food is, it seems to me, takes us into just a whole... Uh, but, a, but a couple of comments. First, I, I don't think that the growth of Whole Foods, and certainly not Trader Joe's, which is extremely moderate and, and indeed even low in price, uh, is doing anything to up the percentage of, of income that's being, household income that's being diverted towards um, food. I'm not sure from the question or whether or not you think it's a bad thing, um, but, but the most successful food retailers in the country at the moment are going to market, whether they're on the supermarket side or whether they're on the restaurant side, on a combination of what you've been hearing. Nikki just did a nice job talking about value and flavor and attractive foods, but s simply talking in terms of percentages or equations um, is not something that is, I think, typically a part of, of the food retailing environment in this country. I mean, it's, it's just not, I don't think, how we approach the issue. Although it's open, again, in other circles to, to great debate and discussion, I understand, certainly from a philosophical or geopolitical point of view. And I think it'll be fun to watch. Millennials are definitely rising in purchasing power. They're not at the position right now that they are fully in that spending habit, which a lot of our other consumers are. But just as you know, Nikki said, you know, they are looking for that experience and how can they have that um, in what, whether they're in food service or retail. And they're also trying to consider, you know, social responsibility within it. But at the end of the day, you know, our research consistently shows it's about the quality, it's about the taste, it's about the cost still with this group. You know, they will shop at places that they feel more socially responsible, but if they can't afford it, they're not going to buy. So it's still, this is a cost conscious, quality, taste, um, kind of consumer base that we're still working with. Other questions from the floor for this panel? Really good topic. On this side. Uh, hi, on the on the topic, what millennials want versus what they buy, what, could you identify an example of a disparity or two or three of, of what they s I think I know where you're going. Can you can you highlight any of the disparities out there between where they say one thing and do another when it comes to ringing the cash register? Like every other human being, when millennials are filling out surveys, this means on things of, of value, uh, times tend to be a little bit out there in terms of what they intend to do uh, and when they, what they actually purchase. For instance, they may want to be healthier and they may say that they are on a certain diet or purchasing certain things, but the realities are they're like all of us, you know, they're still buying ice cream too. And I, you know, even looking at pork, since I represent uh, the pork kind of industry, we have a lot of consumers who want an antibiotic free option. Consumer choice is absolutely important that's out there. But, you know, just as our previous speakers mentioned too, only 2% or less are actually purchasing because it comes at a higher cost as well. And so that's something that needs to be considered. Although you may say you want this, you won't pay for that. Cage-free eggs is a great example. You go to the shopping market, the 98-cent carton of eggs versus the $2, which one is always sold out? The cheaper model. So then my question is, as a follow-up, how, how do we balance being responsive to the consumer? Because we don't want to ignore, I mean, we've been hearing all day how, how the millennial wants us to engage with them and be real and honest and, and all these things. So how do we balance being responsive to that audience without ignoring the fact that sometimes <laughs> the things they think they want aren't the things they actually buy or, or vice versa? Well, I, I am sometimes interested 
uh, at the extent to which millennials are just like mom and dad, right? They're just like baby boomers. Because the notion of the me generation, for example, wasn't created for millennials. It was created by Pepsi to talk about baby boomers. And the notion of talking thin but eating fat is something that you folks have been living with now for quite some time because it's typical of baby boomer behavior and of Gen X behavior. I love your comment when people take a survey. They always say, they speak to their ideal selves or they say what they think the is going to register best with the surveyor. It seems to me that you should keep on doing what you're doing, only do more of it. In other words, recognize that there's going to be a kind of schizophrenia Yep, absolutely, there's going to be a market for the double down. Otherwise, KFC wouldn't reintroduce it, okay? And it's completely over the top. But at the same time, there's going to be a market, and there will be occasions on which that very same double down consumer on Monday, on Tuesday, is going to want to have Brussels sprouts on kale, right? And so you've got this balance. And again, I think from your point of view, that's all to the good because it does seem to me that it gives you a very broad, I know we don't use the word target here anymore, but a very broad palette in which to go to, to market and a very broad uh, number of, of, of channels to take uh, to go to market as well. I'm pretty sure if KFC offered Brussels sprouts as a side, that's what I get with my double down. <laughs> sure. just, can, can I, I add one? That just doesn't sound no, all that no, it does, bad. It when doesn't, I think about no, that's it. not. That's not a match. Can I add it's one other piece to this? That millennials um, also they have made it very clear that they are um, that they want the loyalty card programs in in supermarkets changed and to be more rewarding of the things that they. Uh, find specifically uh, interesting and are rewarding. Uh, for instance, they and they're answering for their ideal health self. They want some help. They want the supermarket to help reward them for purchasing those things that are healthy. And so it's not just that oh they have this ideal self and we need to ignore that because what they're really buying is this. No, we've got to pay attention to this. Like all of us have an ideal self of where we want to be, and we want all the help we can to help become that person uh, that we really want to be. Uh, so, question in the back, and Roger will come to you next. I, I know Aiden is fond of Brussels sprouts as well. So, Aiden, your your question. Yeah, I love Brussels sprouts. Um, <laughs> We are uh, obviously very heavily involved in antibiotic-free. That's a big area for all tech. Uh, so we had the opportunity to talk to Chick-fil-A, who made a big splash over their decision or their announcement that in five years' time they're going to remove antibiotics from the, from the chain for producing chicken. And I asked them why, and they said, well, 32% of their consumers said it was the number one issue. And I said, do they really understand what antibiotics are? And then we had that silence of, well, actually, no, because it conflates uh, hormones, it conflates antibiotics, and it conflates anything that they think should not be in the food chain. And I suppose maybe it's repetitive, but how do we parse through, because they're very the difference between an antibiotic being used for growth motion and one being used to control coccidiosis is a huge difference. But economically, one can be replaced relatively cheaply. The other one could cost a lot of money. That's a great question. A lot of it's continuous education. Antibiotics are a really tough issue, as, as you just talked about. There's a lot of capacities with that. That's one thing even noticing with the, with the customers when you're talking with them to understand what is the economic and what is even the environmental impact for taking these decisions out long term for the cost for you. And right now, emotions, it, it still continues to be the number one issue that runs out there. And it's hard. You know, I'll give credit to the food service and retail companies when you ask them, so how many of your consumers are actually asking this? For example, with Walmart, when somebody calls and complains about the use of a gestation stall, do you know if that's an activist or do you know that's your actual consumer? You can't tell, but you still have to answer that question and you still have to talk through it. So part of our work as well is learning to be more transparent and provide more information to the consumer as well as the customer to help them start understanding why we use antibiotics or why we use a certain production practice or farming practice so everybody has a better understanding and so you have your choice. You know, that comes back to a question, you know, Andy asked earlier. It's about choice. It's not about dictation in the marketplace. And so the opportunity to give a consumer choice without dictating to farmers how they do something, that's a good question. 
and how does that work? We had, you know, the opportunity as a, a small business that started in this area to make those decisions uh, about who we wanted to be and what our values were really early on. Um, one, you know, one of those things is, you know, providing antibiotic-free chicken, and you know, where does that come from, and what, you know, where's our sourcing, and how does that work when, you know, we have five locations, but then how does that work when we have 20 and 40 and beyond that? Um, and so that's something that, you know, we're actually kind of changing a little bit about our supply model and um, moving towards, you know, individual locations and farms and ranchers growers that are doing things that, you know, we find are very uh, craft oriented and they're doing very well in their own um, in their own right and then, you know, bring it to a larger scale and we're able to do that right now. We, you know, get our chicken from from Allen Farms on uh, the Eastern Shore. Um, but if we move and we start opening Cava Grills in Denver or Boston or LA, we would look to find the equivalent to an Allen Farms there. Something early on and, um, you know, luckily haven't had to, you know, switch paths, you know, midway, but that, that's just how we're kind of approaching it. Dr. Katie, I think you had your hand up next. Mine's, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a statement or a question, I would like an opinion. Um, some of the trends that are evident though is whether it's antibiotic free, GMO free, organic, no matter which, pick whichever one you want. Um, it starts out as a niche market but then other people pick up on it and it starts to spread and pretty soon you have one chain following another chain and pretty soon that choice disappears and it concerns me when we hear that two percent really are concerned about antibiotic free, six percent are organic, we're looking at very small portions of the public and yet whole supply chains, literally whole supply chains, whole production processes get dictated by that two to six percent. Um, what do we do about that because that really impacts sustainability in the long run in terms of natural resource use? Yeah, I, I just for for what it's worth, um, you know, you you heard me and you saw me. I get sort of agitated when you get on the subject of my, my current hot button, as you heard, ant antibiotics and hormones, because I think that's they're they're just they're waiting to ambush you on that. It seems to me that one of the things that that your industry has to learn, and sh may I say, maybe should have learned after what you've been through with radiation and, and, and LFBT and so on, is that you need activism in the same way that the consumers do. In other words, you're talking, Mr. Katie, about a, a, a phenomenon that's being driven by a, 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 a number of activists who've seized the conversation. You have to do the same thing from your point of view and not wait for it to happen to you. Is it, is it, I guess I'm saying take offense, don't play defense. But you, you consistently, it seems to me, over the last couple of decades have been sort of ambushed. But now there's no excuse to be ambushed because all you have to do is turn on your smartphone, which is what Andy's been doing through this whole program, and, and look at what's being said. Now, I had mentioned, I think, in, in one of my slides, about enlisting some advocates who would make sense, because because unfortunately, and and but understandably, those of you who represent the cattlemen or the pork producers or so on, seen as being very biased, and nobody believes anything the government says. So for goodness sakes, don't enlist them uh, in your support. Um, but but think about the people who do influence the conversation. I think you've done a great job, and you need to do more with chefs. How many people does Dan Kish feed in a week? right? He influences masses of people in a very positive way. Pork producers do great work with chefs, but go all the way from the fine dining, think about the mass market, because they really determine what consumers eat now. We're chef, chef driven, chefs lead, and then restaurants, then supermarkets fall in. Think about the, the mom community, Mm -hmm. that, do you know Common Ground is that? Do you know what Common Ground is? is that the right name? It's the group of farm mothers who are saying, wait, wait a minute, why would we feed? We're moms. Why would we do that? Wait, 
we have the same interests you do, so let's talk about this. But you've got to get a hold of the conversation, and you've got to start controlling it and stop letting it control you. Transparency. Uh, we're, we've been a little late to the game sometimes on some of these issues, and it's about, one, matching the language so it's understandable, but two, being honest. We have to be really transparent about what we do in agriculture, and we need to be making sure we're telling the right people in the food service and retail industry, too, so as they start hearing these things, hopefully they can go, you know what, we've heard it from other three third-party resources. We've heard it whether it's from academics, veterinarians, from farmers. You know, we have heard about these practices, and now we have a little bit better understanding, so okay, hold on, maybe this issue isn't quite what I think it is. But we actively need to be telling our story, and we need to be telling everything about what we do in agriculture. Yeah, that's a good one, Angela. The saying that we were a little late uh, a little late to the game occasionally is like saying Gettysburg was an armed conflict. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty good, David. You, you had something to add, I, I, I sense. Well, I was going to echo some of, of what Angela was was saying in terms of that we were a little late to the game and that we've got to engage. We are three or four generations removed from the farm now. Uh, and there were a couple of generations that said, I don't care how it's produced, I'm just grateful someone else is doing that for me and I'm not going to ask any questions. Well, that day is over and gone and we and I don't know of any farmer who goes into farming because they love you know press relations and they love doing media but we've got to engage them because they are one of the most trusted groups that people, uh, when you ask a farmer why they do, choose to grow what they grow and how they, why they choose to do it the way they do it, it carries great authority uh, with the audience. And so we've got to engage better with the farmers and the ranchers and get their voice and their story out there because that's been silent. And we've got to get that one out uh, because that will answer a lot of the questions. And David, you, I think you just described my, my folks in a sense. I grew up on a small farm, and it was funny because I got to thinking one day, Dad grew up on a dairy farm, was one of five kids. Mom grew up on a dairy farm, was one of four kids. We didn't have the first dairy cow in our place. I said, Dad, you grew up on a dairy farm milking cows. Mom grew up on a dairy farm milking cows. Why don't we have any cows? He said, because your mom and I grew up on a dairy farm milking cows. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, Ray, you can set me back on the straight and narrow later on. So, okay, other questions from the floor? We've got a few more minutes with this panel. Uh, right on center aisle there. Then we'll come up to the front. I, I like a lot of the comments that I'm hearing, but um, from the beef industry perspective, um, I'll just say this. As marketers, you're responding, you've already said, you're responding to consumers' emotional reaction to things. From an industry point of view, we're, and even if you're talking about those producers out there, those are actual real things. Um, industry responds with science. The trick is you're responding to a consumer need that's been identified through marketing polls, but what is that need based on? It's not based on anything real, it's based on an emotion. So we can come back and say, well, we've got the science that shows ionophores are this, they're fine, withdrawal times, yada, yada, yada. But it, there's a disconnect there between what we do, which is real, how we measure it, which is real, and what you're measuring in terms of where your marketing programs are going. So that's a disconnect that exists. So I just want to know if that ever sort of comes into, into play when you make your marketing decisions. I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that you're making an excellent point. Uh, the only part that I would counter to say is that while a lot of the the decisions that are being made on the farm are real. The emotions that some of the uh, retailers are having to deal with on the part of their consumers are real as well. They're just maybe not science-based, maybe not fact-based, but they are emotions that are nonetheless legit that need to be listened to. And I think we've got to do a better job at, okay, let's cut through all the emotion and all the hoopla of that, and let's get down to the facts. and and. As already been pointed out, there's kind of a the side of the of the equation that most food decisions are made on, and that is cost and convenience and quality or taste. Those are the three most important things that are on the consumer's mind. There are also, on the other side of the equation, though, a lot of value-laden decisions, locally produced, organic, GMO, uh, antibiotic-free, uh, cage-free. All these things are tend to be very small percentages, but those, what I would say, are growing 
is that more and more people are starting to choose their retailer and starting to choose their products on the basis of where do you stand on these, do you share my values is what the consumer is asking. And again, we're not, retailers are all about choice. You know, we're fine with there being a plethora of choices out there. Um, in fact, we, we like that, we embrace that. Um, and so we're not about dictating to the consumer, but I think that there is much more education on all of these issues, particularly the value-laden ones, and a lot more that needs to be out there. And again, my point is we've got to engage where the consumer is getting their information, or in some cases, in many cases, their misinformation. And David, would I be right in assuming if, if you look back at the historical data at the supermarket, uh, the number of items on the shelf today much, much larger at the average location than it was even 10 years ago. Is that, is that a fair the average, assumption? The average supermarket carries 38,000 SKUs, 38,000 different products. It's a lot of choice. Yes. yes. Or a lot of choice potential, at least. Yeah. And the, only, the only thing I would add is if, if you start with science, you end with science in the conversation to a consumer. We have to meet them at emotion. You know, we have to acknowledge their concerns, understand where they're coming from, and once you develop a rapport and a relationship in that conversation, then you can start talking and introducing the facts and the science. But continuously, we've seen if you start with the science and the facts, they just ignore everything. Go, that's it. You're not listening to me. You don't care. And do you think that we, as a as a group, have done yet um, an, an even passable job yet of understanding the underlying issues under the emotions? I, I, I'm asking maybe a rhetorical question that we all know the answer to, but let, let's talk about that for a minute because we we tend to be dismissive of emotions, and I don't I don't mean to make it sit, you know criticize your question, but we tend to be dismissive of emotions. How can we do a better job of understanding, doing what the millennials were telling us this morning, and understanding what they're really being concerned about? Well, I I, I think, gosh, I think the panel this morning was just enormously helpful because they they were a group of real live captive millennials telling us what they really thought and giving us some sense of their thought process I thought that was enormously helpful and I think more of that kind of listening is is what's certainly a good starting point. Happy birthday, you know. We do make a lot of you know decisions based on emotions, but you know they're not just thrown out there, and we're just trying to stick things on the wall and see if see if they work. And usually, if that happens, if they don't, um, you know, we like to test a lot of things by out, you know, yes, with our 24 and 29 year olds, but also with um, you know the, the um, you know larger families that come into Kala and their children who are you know you know, 10 and younger, right? An older couple who's um, dining together before a movie or something like that. We, you have to, you know, test things out with multiple generations of people and and go beyond those emotions, but a lot of times the emotions, you know, we were saying, they, they are real. And it's hard to quantify a lot of them. We can try to use our data you know, based on sales or loyalty to kind of uh, drill down on that, but I think there's a lot of qualitative data that we can find, especially through, um, you know, a little quicker, um, you know, social conversations that we're having with our customers um, that may not be in a formal survey or um, through a formal uh, kind of complaint process, but a um, little one off, so we see trends over and we collect that data, and, you know, a lot of people have been saying this one thing, like, let's um, let's pay attention to that. What can we do that's different? I guess my, my point is, though, that where I think people get their information from form their opinions. And I can't help but think that this sort of uh, snowball of marketing campaign about naming and rating the free index or what's something from that. Yeah, do we agree if we that loop by promoting all these trends, features, benefits, buzzwords, and reinforce? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. A good, uh, Concern probably many of us share, and, 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 and I'd say you know, I'll give you your opinion the last, uh, the last part, I'll give you the high sign the back of the room. So, a round of applause for a really great panel. And what great uh, questions you all had. So, before uh, getting out of here,
next seat so let me give you uh, uh, your next set of terms of good moral presentation today. Uh, okay, I'll be the first to moderate. We're going to play a game called Andy Sets. Now, wait, 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 wait. Before you move, we have one more really good presentation I want you to see. But, so take your right arm, just stretch it up a little bit. Oh, come on, you've never played Andy Sets before? Can you just stretch? You can take your left arm, stretch it out a little bit. Pick up your right foot, wiggle it around, clockwise circle, pick up your left foot, wiggle it around, counterclockwise circle. Good, you're fine. Okay. Well, Andrew is our last speaker of the day. I uh, didn't want to think we really could get a lot of enjoyment out of it. And also, came into the agricultural sector on a somewhat unusual path this time around as in aerospace engineering. But in 2009, Mary Parker, who grew up showing her that my name was Cal, before long, then retired working in a cubicle, decided to want to pursue something that would make a difference and make the world a better place. So, what is it, Jerry John Halifax? Google the alternative to help create a farmlawn.com website. It is now the introduction manager for Farm One. We're going to fall in love with farming and develop a passion for telling viral stories through video. Please welcome Ben Wilson. Everybody hear me okay? Well, thank you, Andy. I'm really excited to be here. I uh, know I'm the, the last speaker today. I'm standing with two new folks and some PC orders, so I did it fairly quick and I got about 25 minutes of your time. And I'm going to use that to tell you a couple of, I uh, hope, very engaging stories. Um, as I said, I came into the uh, agriculture sector on an unusual level. Uh, I want to start by just asking one question How many people are out here have been to a cow show, even just once? Okay, that's what I figured. Just to give you a bit of perspective on where I came from, um, I didn't know that cows was even existed until I met my wife and I grew up showing black and spent her entire life. That was all she knew. I didn't even know it existed. I was picturing like a dog show, but I replaced the dogs and peppers and skiers. And I'm thinking, like, we were dating and I literally asked her, what kind of tricks did they do? Like, I grew up in a small town in uh, Western Canada, so I don't know where that. Um, the other reason I'm excited to be here is that a few days ago it was snowing in Alberta. Um, so, if you have the opportunity to come speak at a tropical climate, I'm there. <laughs> um, but as I said, uh, after I quit my engineering job in, in Halifax, uh, my wife and I moved back to Alberta and I became a new production manager for the Department of Foundation. So, essentially, what that means is a digital storyteller. There we go. Okay, so the story I'm going to tell you about um, this afternoon is the hero's journey as it pertains to the millennial generation of farmers. Not so much consumers, but I'm going to kind of focus on the millennial farmer. And so, as an outsider looking in on your industry, um, I truly believe that we are on the verge of witnessing an epic story unfolding in agriculture. And the hero of that story. I will submit to you is the young farmer. So it's a story about a generation of young farmers who is about to take over the reins, and they're facing them as a set of challenges that have never been faced before by any previous generation. It's literally like it's their mission or their quest that they're setting out on to go ahead and design and build from you know, an engineering path. They need to design and build the industry that you're going to have in the next 30 years. It's the industry that is going to feed 9 million people, and they need to figure out a way to do it with using less water, less energy, the same amount of less land, and have a more positive impact on the environment than ever before in human history. That's no small feat. So, who is this farmer? Well, we know that all over the world, farmers are getting older. The average age of the farmer in most developed countries is approaching 60. And meanwhile, the number of young farmers who are setting in to take those positions of farmers who are at a near retirement age is actually declining at a rapid rate. In Canada, uh, over the last 20 years, the number of farmers under the age of 35 has actually decreased by 75 percent. Now, I've had the good fortune over the last five years of working with Farmon 
to have met a lot of young farmers in Canada. I've spoken with them, shaking their hands, but no one there. That's become my social network on the ground as well as through social media. And I can tell you without any doubt that one thing that is not lacking for them is passion. And I think everyone would really agree with that. Um, they have a passion, they just haven't been facing a lot of large obstacles in this industry. And to illustrate this, uh, I'll give you an example of that. One of you in part of the table here is Melissa. I was speaking with her um, about a month ago at a conference. And so, in my mind, she kind of is typical of the demographic. Melissa and her husband are in their mid 30s. They live in the city of Calgary, but they both grew up on cattle farms in the Toronto area. And Melissa and her husband have, like I said, there's no lack of passion. They want an infinite world to be getting onto the farm, their own farm. As it is right now, they're both working full time in careers that are related to agriculture. He's an MBA in Canada, works on the combines in large farm equipment. She works with a beef marketing firm in Alberta. And they love their work, but really their dream is to raise their kids on the farm and to have their own land. So, Farm Home set out about five or six months ago, we set out to identify what some of the largest challenges were the farms are facing from their perspective. We weren't going to just you know, sit in an office and do our research and say, yeah, we know what the answers are, we know what the challenges are, we want to hear it from them. So, we went to five or six really small. Um, agricultural communities in rural Alberta to just get a sample of this. We gathered young farmers together in a room, we called it the Young Farmers Forum in five or six months. Um, the challenges that they identified, um, the biggest one, which is the top of the list, were access to land, because land is so expensive, and that's pretty universal. Um, lack of opportunity, because maybe mom and dad weren't ready to retire yet. Um, financing, uh, weather issues, consumer awareness. The list was pretty long, actually. But what was interesting is that in a lot of that we went to, the list was almost exactly the same. And I'm almost positive that that's not just because we stayed in Alberta. The, the, and we hear this online as well. So, through our, our 13,000 followers that our mom has, just to be clear, Facebook, we're hearing the same issues echoed from Australia, and from the UK, and from all over the world. Now, in any great story, I would submit to you that the hero never acts alone. If the challenge that the hero is facing is not larger than that individual hero, it's probably not going to be a great story. And as I said at the beginning, I believe this is an epic story. So, if the challenges are so huge that they're bigger than the individual farmer, they're going to need support. We know that. But what kind of support? And what kind of support are they going to need? Digital age, where it's an industry that's been accused of uh, being behind the times and adapting to and adopting new technology and digital and getting into the digital age. Well, three core values that Carmon has identified are in providing the young farmer with access to learning, connections to each other, and connections to the consumer, and inspiration. And because learning was uh, one area that we decided to focus on mostly in the beginning a few years ago, we went out and we developed an online social learning platform that we call Farm Masters. So you can check it out if you go to farmon.com. Uh, it's free to sign up and become a member, check out uh, the content. It's all kinds of video workshops and articles that range from how to, how to market your product, how to price your product. How to uh, navigate your way through successful by working with your lawyer or accountant, building an advisory team. Basically, gaining the skills that you need as a young farmer to be successful in this industry because we know that even the young farmers who have been through egg college programs, which is a lot of them, they still need additional support beyond their college education. But they don't have time to take, to take it in and weekend workshops or you know, traveling. Away from their home, having an accessible online visit to them and their fingertips. So we focused on that. And then just two months ago, we launched what we're calling the Fast Farm, which is a brand new accelerated learning program that focuses on a lot of how to hands on skills. And the first series of the Fast Farm that we launched was all about grazing management. So for farmers who are interested in getting into grazing, maybe knew a little bit about it, but they want to actually set up a grazing system. 
this is for them. So like I said, it's not a little high level, just test. Is this model going to work? So like we said this morning, um, don't just pick one idea from the ocean idea and then get to it. Try out a few and test them out and see what works and learn as you go. That's just what the philosophy we had at Parkland.com. So we, we tried out this first series in the class part on grazing. Um, early success, or early uh, indications show that it's quite successful. The people who were testing it out for us are saying that they're loving it. And we're now at that point where we've got 1,500 members that are registered on our site. But we know that we're not the only organization that realizes the importance of mentoring the young partner, providing mentorship opportunities. They exist all over the world, um, both on the ground and online. But our team in particular, in the last, especially in the last year or so, we've really been able to realize that where our passion lies as individuals is. is you know, we think that the learning is very important, but our real passion is in providing inspiration to young farmers. So we wrote a script and we created a video that I'm going to show you here that's called um, the Farm Line Manifesto. <laughs> So that's the Farm On Manifesto. Thank you. Before I go to the next slide, I just wanted to share one short story with you. After we launched that video, about three months later, I was at a conference, and um, Melissa, the farmer that I was telling you about just a few minutes ago, she came up to me, and she looked kind of emotional. And I, I had played that video during my presentation at this conference, and she said, Ben, I just I had to come up and tell you that the day that you guys put that video out, I showed it to my husband the second he came in the door, and I sat him down, and we watched it, and we were crying, and, and I said to him, it's been 12 years that we've been thinking about doing this. We, let's do it. We're, we're raising our kid and kids in the city. It's not the life that we want. We want to raise them on the farm. We've got to find a way to make it happen. And two weeks after that conversation, they had a meeting with her husband's parents, and it all just started clicking and falling into place. They started succession planning, 
and I'm really excited um, to say that this summer they're moving on to the farm. At least that's the latest that she told me. And it's so validating to, to hear those kind of stories. But there's the dark side, right? In any great story, think of Star Wars, there always has to be um, a villain. So as everyone in the room knows, um, consumers are largely disconnected where, uh, from where their food comes from. Most consumers in developed countries are three generations or more removed from the farm. And this is where they're getting a lot of their information. They're getting it from um, you know, the, the Chipotle scarecrow ad. They're getting it from documentaries. They're getting it when they walk down the street of a lot of cities and they see these kind of um, you know, really radical displays of meat is murder. And it's, it's dramatic, but this is, this is the truth for, in quotes, for a lot of um, disconnected consumers. And I'm saying that from the perspective of someone who used to be one. I was in engineering um, at Carleton University in Ottawa uh, 10 years ago, and I believed this kind of stuff. I, I'd, I'd never been to a farm, really. I hadn't spent much time on any farms anyway. I didn't really know any farmers. And so when issues came up and they were getting past, we didn't really have Facebook back then, of course, but um, you know, there'd be events on campus, and they'd be screening a documentary similar to Food Inc. or that kind of thing. It was before that time too, but dating myself. But I believed it because I didn't have time to go and check other sources. It's just like you know a lot of the perspectives that we've heard from already today. Um, consumers are, have such a short attention span. And this stuff is entertaining. It's entertaining as hell. It, the farm's in dangerous. If you haven't seen the, the preview for it, check it out. It looks really funny, but it scares me from the perspective of someone who is passionately invested and committed to the future of the egg industry. Now, when you look at some of the numbers, organizations like PETA and Chipotle, they have a large voice. And obviously, a big part of that is because they have a large budget. Um, we compared those numbers against the total views of all the members of the, the AFAC, there stands for Alberta Farm Animal Care Association. And Sure, that's just Alberta, but that's Alberta pork, Alberta beef, which is pretty huge, Alberta dairy, Alberta milk, sorry, Alberta egg producers. There's a long list of member organizations and producer associations that if you stack all of their figures up, they're literally just minuscule compared to the giant voice of, um, for lack of a better term, anti-egg or anti-big egg. Um, and maybe that would be slightly less depressing if we stacked on top of the, those numbers all of the other provinces in Canada and all the states and combined it all. But I would, I would venture to guess that it's still a pretty intimidating battle. And what's worse is that in an effort to survive and in an effort to distinguish ourselves and the production methods that we are using as farmers, and I use the proverbial we, of course, we're actually beginning to even make each other wrong. So we call it the war we never saw coming, farmer versus farmer. Pick any debate, whether it's the GMO or antibiotic debate, there are farmers on both sides. And instead of just disagreeing but supporting each other, we're actually doing battle with each other. We're picking a stance because we're being asked to, to take a position, and we're saying, we're right, they're wrong. The way we're doing it is better. Look at the A&W campaign. The, the way we're doing it is better. Therefore, every other way of doing it must be wrong, worse. You get the idea. So we got pretty tired of, of this happening, and uh, someone on our team wrote a pretty strongly worded article that's on our site here. Uh, we created this, this graphic that kind of tells a little bit of a story and takes our, shows our stance on the, on the, uh, the Chipotle campaign. And uh, we put it out there. Um, it did pretty well. We had a lot of people sharing it on Facebook. It was getting passed around. And then one of our followers had this to say about it. Thank you very much for writing this article. As I've said before, your site is one of the few agriculture sites that does believe we are all in this together. Keep up the good work. So it really cemented for our team uh, as a core value that if we really truly want to make a difference in this industry, we have to work together. And that means stop the fighting. <laughs> Because we also realize that it's not about us anyway. We can all go out there and create different campaigns and different movements, and we can support each other's movements. But it's not about us as organizations. It's not about farmon.com. It's about the individual farmers. Social media 
essentially gives the microphone back to the individual. We're not sitting in front of a TV anymore being forced to watch advertisements. We skip them. We, we, we consume media in a completely different way than we did 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. And the good news in this epic story that, that I'm attempting to tell here is that I believe some, some mentors are starting to emerge and they're starting to light the way. And these are just a couple of examples. There are many others. But providing a platform, I would say, is not enough in its own right. You can create a platform, you can create um, a campaign, but if you don't have an established relationship with the people that you want to join that campaign, it's not going to go anywhere. And establishing those relationships requires conversations, and I would say that the best place for a conversation to start is in a story. Um, as organizations, if we're going to go out there and say, yeah, we're going we're to create relationships with farmers or with consumers, and we're going to do that by telling our story, um, you might have some success, but I would say that there's a lot more success to be found by starting with their story, listening first, engaging in the, in the, the stories of the heroes who are out there doing great things already. Engage in those stories, start to participate, start to develop that two-way relationship, and out of that you will gain credibility, and you'll gain trust with the people who you want to join your movement. So that's the real power, I believe, behind AgChat is, is that AgChat is about the stories of farmers. It's not AgChat telling a story. It's farmers, real farmers that have mud on their boots, stories. Um, it's the same with the Felfi hashtag. It's been the huge craze this last year. It's, you're seeing their, their face, the passion in their eyes, and the joy that they have as they're hugging their steer or their holding up their little uh, goose or whatever it is. And of course, the Peterson Farm Brothers, their parody videos that have gone viral, it's authentic. It's not, they're not trying to spin something or sell you something. They're just saying, this is just what we do. And we're going to show you in a really entertaining and fun way. Um, the one in the top left corner, Farm Voices, of course, is the campaign that we started um, a year and a half ago. And it's centered on Earth Day. The idea behind Farm, farm Voices is we've called farmers around the world to action on one day. We are the stewards of the land as farmers, and so let's take back Earth Day. On that one day, on April 22nd, let's post as many stories as we can to get the world's attention. Um, stories of why we care, how we care for our land and our animals, why we're so passionate about farming in the first place, and what are some of the biggest ch challenges and issues that, are, uh, that we have to overcome in this industry. So thousands of, of farmers have uh, participated from 25 countries around the world, and it's pretty exciting to see it happen. If we stand for farmers, traditional, organic, big, or small, doesn't matter. If we stand for real, living, breathing farmers, we can change the world. This is a postcard that we created for the first year of the Farm Voices movement. And uh, it was one of, we've, we've created about 15 or 20 of these, I think, and we've found that they're so shareable because it just takes a few seconds to read it, uh, that a t short attention span again. There are two or three minute videos like the manifesto are great and they're powerful. They can convey a lot of emotion, but sometimes people just want something that's so short that they can just click and pass it along. So some of these postcards that we've created have had you know, thousands and thousands of shares and it's so exciting to see it happening because we're such a small team from central Alberta. But this one in particular, we started to see it popping up here and there in different places where people had cropped off the bottom that has our website and the Farm Voices <laughs> hashtag on it because they really loved it and they just wanted the message, I don't care about the farm on stuff. And when I first saw that, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> this isn't fair. That's ours. You can't do that. And I was, I was kind of offended, if I'm really honest. But we, we were talking about this as a team. And uh, Sarah, one of our teammates, said to me, Ben, don't you understand what's happening? They're taking it on as their own. Like They're sharing it be, and wanting people to believe that it's theirs, that they created it, or that, or that it's their message. And that is exactly what we set out to do. We should be celebrating the fact that people are doing this. And so um, a couple of months later, when the Peterson brothers shared this postcard on their website without our name on the bottom, we were like, right on. It's got even a bigger you know, exposure. So we really had to learn to, it was a great opportunity to learn to walk the walk. If we truly believe that it's not about us, the movement is about the farmers, then the recognition and the credit shouldn't matter. 
I've got one last video that I want to share with you that we've called If You've Always Wanted to Farm. And what it is is we've taken some powerful words from the late Steve Jobs uh, that really, I believe, apply to where the millennial farmer is at today. Because the real power of storytelling is that if the story is good and if you tell it well, hopefully, just maybe, people will see themselves in it. So I invite you to see yourself in this story. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect. Uh oh. Oh, can we play it right off the file that's on the USB stick, maybe, instead of Vimeo? That might work better. Anybody know any good jokes? This is your chance to catch up on your Twitter feed and maybe take a take let's, a selfie. Let's let's do this uh, while we're waiting on the technical side of things. Uh, let's take one or two questions for Ben. We'll just move the Q and A portion of the program sure. to now, uh, and then then if we get the video back up, we'll watch that. And if not, I'll donate that three minutes out of my presentation tomorrow morning for people to see your video. So, uh, questions for Ben. Ben, Dr. what Ashford. might be the source of your funding? What is the source of your funding? So the Farmont Found is a foundation, and uh, the Farmont Foundation is in Canada. It's a little bit different than um, than in the states, but we're the equivalent of a 501c non for profit. So we're a registered uh, charity and a non profit in Canada, um, but we are an international organization. So it opens us up to various uh, forms of foundational funding and also uh, government grants. So uh, we've been around for six years. Uh, we got started on the pocketbooks of people like my wife, um, who started the organization with, with their own sweat equity and, and dollars. Um, but we have built our website using uh, grant funding from provincial and federal um, dollars in Canada. Um, but we are a charity as well. Thanks. Good. OK. I'm getting, I'm getting good vibes from the back of the room. So Do you want to continue with the we'll, Q&A? We'll, let's, sure. let's, watch, let's watch the video. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Sometimes life's gonna hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is gonna fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking, don't settle. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, Death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it's quite true. 
Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. I just want to leave you with two parting um, takeaways to mull over tonight as you're networking and connecting with other people in the industry. And that's really why we're, we're all here. So we'll get to it. But the first one is tell your story. Tell it with authenticity above anything else and engage with the story of the heroes who are part of your story. The second point is that together we are more. I'll leave you with a quote by Simon Sinek who said, changing the world takes more than everything that any one person knows, but not more than what we know together. So let's work together and let's support young farmers. Thank you for your time. Great job, great presentation. I know several of us will look forward to learning more about all of the efforts that you and your team are putting forward. Thanks for sharing those videos with us and your message and your story. So before you move from your seats, I have a few things that you need to know about the rest of the evening and tomorrow morning. Uh, ben will be around, so I'd encourage you if you had questions for him that we didn't get to uh, due to time constraints, certainly mingle with him during the reception. You need to complete your afternoon evaluations. They're on the table in front of you. If you've not already done so, please do them before you move from your chair. Breakfast tomorrow will be served between 7 and 8 in Salon 4, uh, in the foyer of Salon 4, 7 to 8, and we will start sharply at 8 a.m., so I'd love for you to have uh, consumed mass quantities of breakfast and found your way to your seat by 8 a.m. sharp. Enjoy the reception tonight. Do not forget the silent auction because the proceeds benefit the Alliance's internship program and find one of our college Aggies who are waving raffle tickets around in the back of the room to buy your tickets for the raffle prize to SeaWorld. Please continue the conversation via Twitter and the hashtag. It's been really great watching your feedback throughout the course of the day. Thank you for being a tremendous audience and enjoy this evening's festivities at the reception. Farm on. <laughs>